Happy New Year from all of us here at VinWiki. I hope that you've had an amazing 2021, and I hope that 2022 is even better. This will now be the third year in a row that we've done a countdown to the new year with our top 10 car stories of this year. So these are our top 10 car stories of 2021. There have been some amazing stories told and some amazing view counts on many of them, so I hope that you enjoy the chance to watch them again. And we're doing it as always as a premiere. So please join us in the chat function. Let us know what your New Year's resolutions are, what your favorite stories of the year were, and where you're watching from. I'd like to thank our sponsor of this video, Glossit. We started working a lot with Glossit this year, and we're going to do a lot more fun stuff with them in the coming year. This year, it was primarily with the Paris Hilton SLR. They intercepted the car on its way to me from Los Angeles, detailed it to perfection, and I truly enjoyed owning it. It is still glistening clean in Bulgaria now. Now. So be sure to check out the latest special offer for VinWiki viewers at the link in the description below to thank Glossip for their support of the channel. Once again, Happy New Year and enjoy our top 10 car stories of 2021. You're going to get shot. People are going to hate you. You are going to be the scum of the earth with these people turning off their cars. Well, before YouTube and all of this, I'm a 10-year survivor of the car business. My first job in the car business was opening a CarMax in Wichita, Kansas, opening day, trying to explain to people how CarMax works, which wasn't a familiar concept back then. No haggle pricing, all the weird things they do. People just thought I was a jerk and not discounting the car at all. It was a bunch of Ed Bullions trying to shrewdly negotiate it. I'm like, the price is the price. We're meeting you smack dab in the middle at, at the price, and that, that's it. That's it and uh, it didn't work out. I wasn't very good. I really was one of the last people to sell a car of all those people at the dealership. I think I sold three cars in the first month. It took me a long time to get my groove and figure it out, but I really didn't like the structure of CarMax at the time. You had to say the same thing over and over again. They did not want you to deviate from the script at all. There's a wrecked car in the showroom. They wanted to show people the wrecked car, tell them you would not sell them this wrecked car because CarMax is special. But people would say, well, would you sell me the wrecked car for a discount? It was, it was, can I buy this car if it's cheap? They, they didn't understand. They wanted to go out and look at the cars. You had to go through this whole song and dance. It was irritating. I quit maybe after four months. So the next job in the car business was at a Chevrolet Cadillac BMW store, which resulted in an amazing crazy experience with drunks and dysfunctional adults. Uh, there's another story from way back when, one of my first tellings here at Benwicky that uh, culminated into a, a crazy situation. But that was very different. The first person I ever walked up and talked to at that dealership, uh, they bought a truck full sticker. This was 2007 when the new Chevys had come out. Paid full sticker for it. I made $1,500 my first day. CarMax had made $200 a car. Thought that happened every day, so I went to Ultimate Electronics, bought a plasma screen TV, figuring it would happen the next day. Spent all that money. It didn't happen the next day, or the next day, or the next day. But I did learn a lot. I learned it's a great way if you're interested in cars and wanting to see what that world is like. You learn a lot in the car business. You may not want to stick in it your entire life, but uh, it's definitely a good starting point. But I wanted to go further, but I also wanted to finish college. So working full-time at a dealership and finishing college, it, it was hard to, to, to do that. So I quit and you know just worked odd jobs until I finished college the last couple of years. Graduated with a degree in political science, which is absolutely useless. It was the easiest way out, so why did I go to college? But, but anyway, I was determined at that point to open a car dealership. I thought this would be so easy. I see how much money these dealers are making. If it's mine, I can have all of it. So 2010, I open up Ad Astra Automotive, which means to the stars, that's the Kansas state motto, and I'm a big Mercedes fan, so I thought I'd be specializing in late model used Mercedes. Well, I bought anything that I could make money on. The first day I went to the auction, I actually bought two Jeeps. The first one exploded on the way back from the auction. I sold it to the junkyard. The second one I made about $1,500 and that made up for the loss, so I broke even. But that, that's kind of a theme for the entire existence of my car dealership, which was like five short years. 
And uh, it was very, very hard to make money because these dealer auctions, if that's where you're going to source inventory, like a lot of dealers are struggling with right now, you're not gonna find cars. It takes years to develop these wholesale sources, these honey holes, as they would say in American Pickers, to get these cars. But if you're just going to auction and lane bidding, you're gonna get cars that people don't want and the auction prices are gonna be, as they are right now, just ridiculously high to where you don't make money. So you have the issue with sourcing inventory, which was always a problem. It was also a problem with me because I'm a hoarder and want to keep anything that was cool for myself. I'm like a drug dealer wanting to do too much of his own stuff. But then there's the other side of it, why you don't want to be in the car business. Because it's the only business where people think you are a jerk for making money. You can flip houses and you're not a jerk because you put money into the house, making it nicer. You can flip for more. You can sell groceries. You can sell burgers and, and make money. And you, you're not a jerk for making money off of selling food, anything else but cars. Everybody wants to be like Ed Bullion and make it an adversarial situation where you making money on them is you getting something over on them. You are screwing them over. So it's very frustrating in that aspect. So even though I'm not working for a dealership, I'm still sourcing used cars from dealerships. They're wanting to make money. And then you're dealing with a customer. So on the back end, you're having trouble making money because they're able to look everything up on a computer and see how much everything's supposed to be worth. And so they want to pay trade-in. They think they should be buying it trade-in and selling it retail, just like everybody. So it's an endless frustrating deal. And I wasn't making any money. I realized I was going to struggle forever to maybe crack into six figures, maybe. There was never a year in the car business where I made six figures. Maybe someday, maybe in this crazy environment we are now, I probably could have if I had stuck it out. But in those five years, I never made it. So I was failing. I knew I wasn't doing that well and I actually moved locations to a more expensive location thinking that would help, shared it with another dealer and they went under. So then it was all me in this one space. It got worse. So I decided, well, if I'm gonna survive, I need to change my business model entirely. And I see what these buy here, pay here dealers are doing. It doesn't matter how much they pay for the car. It really doesn't matter what they sell them for. As long as they're decent cars that are gonna last the life of the loan, they will make a fortune. And it's just money coming in month after month after month. And you get enough of those cars sold and it's a numbers game to where enough people make their payments, you're making money. The problem is, Every time I had done a little short-term financing thing with somebody, I was the worst debt collector ever. I would say, okay, you don't have enough money for the sales tax. You have 30 days before you come get the title to pay the sales tax. They would never have the money. Any loan that I did with anybody, they never paid me and they would walk all over me. It's like it was written on my face. I am a sucker. Even though I'm a car dealer, I am a sucker. And there's one woman that stands out. She was a teacher at a high school and she just needed a car. And I took this van on trade for $1,000 and I sold it to her for $2,500, something like that. A reasonable profit for a good running and driving van. And she put $1,000 down. This was kind of an experiment for me. And she drove off with the car, she has a special needs son, the whole sob story. She's a teacher, she has a good job. Her credit's bad because this, this, and this. Well, the check she gave me bounced right off the bat. So I call her up. She says she messed something up to where she didn't realize she'd come with the money. It took about a month for me to get that $1,000. And then once I got that $1,000, then she was talking about how the van was broken down and didn't work anymore. But then I would see her, Wichita, Kansas is a small town. I'd see her driving around in the van. So then I know I'm just absolutely being played and that's what happened so many times. It was gonna be a very difficult business, but I figured I could get somebody to handle that and we'd do the, the payment boxes where the cars would shut off and the tracking so you know where the cars are and I was, actually wanting to do a rent to own concept, which is a little different because, you know, you don't have to do credit checks and all this stuff, but the repossession is a little different when it's a rental. You're not taking away somebody's property. It's a rental until they own it. The laws are a little different from what I understood. And my father has been in business for a very, very long time. He was in the oil business, hated that because he couldn't determine the price of oil, got out of it around when I was born. So he's actually a geologist by trade. But then he got into uh, fast food restaurants and uh, bought a bunch of Taco Bells. And that was basically his livelihood. I go to him with my idea in this business model and I wanted to show it to him before I took it to the bank to see if they would finance me on this venture. And he looked at it, flipped through everything and just thought, you're going through all the trouble for this. You're going to get shot. People are going to hate you. You are going to be the scum of the earth with these people turning off their cars 
you don't want to do this and not for this kind of money. So he turned around, he printed off a spreadsheet showing me what he was making with restaurants, specifically this new venture, Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers and said, I'm starting to get involved with this. You can get in with me and work in the stores. It's gonna be different. You're gonna be flipping burgers and traveling a lot, but this could be a good thing for you. And I actually took his advice. I walked away from the car business entirely and thought I was done. Maybe someday I would be able to finance my dreams with burgers instead of cars. I could actually own cars without having to flip them to make a living. That sounded pretty good, but what I didn't realize was it was literally flipping burgers for years. And I went to training and realized that I'm learning how to flip burgers and churn custard and also how to run a business. And it was definitely an adjustment. Went to the first opening, had a great guy in place who was kind of a mentor that came over from my dad's Taco Bells, who was still involved. The two of us and some other people, we just built a great crew of opening stores. It's up to 11 stores now, but right around the time that things started to get on autopilot and we had people in place, I thought, well, I still wanna do something with cars. So I thought, well, maybe I can write. I've always wanted to write. So on the side, when I'm down in say a hotel or apartment that we lease for a long time while stores being open, I can write articles on cars. And it took a little while to get my foot in the door. The Jeremy Clarkson meeting him, which is another Vin Wiki story, is, uh, is basically my big launching moment. Also getting on Doug DeMiro's coattails, writing that up resulted in me having a YouTube channel that took off. And now, of course, YouTube is my full-time job. So I'm still involved with the Freddy's, just a, s a small little bit that I have a piece of. You take one step in the store, that's, that's probably my step. So I still check in sometimes like the Queen of England or something, you know, just, just wave at the people that, that know what they're doing. I'm, I'm so out of it at this point, but they're, they're all great. They're doing a fantastic job. And me getting out of the car business, basically hitting the reset button and exploring this new avenue, this, this whole history enabled me to be in this place right now where I have all the cars really that I've ever wanted and more, and I'm just super lucky. So walking away from something when you know it's bad can be a good thing and it can come full circle like it is now. And uh, well, I'm, I'm sitting in here telling stories. Isn't that cool? Patrick Adair Designs makes some of the coolest rings out of the most interesting and exotic materials on earth. Whether it's a wedding band, a fashion ring, or just whatever reason you want to wear a ring, he and his team have an amazing selection of awesome products that I'm sure you will love. Last year he made me this ring and a series of rings out of one of the broken wheels from an old Lamborghini that I had. And so we're going to do some collaborations on other exotic car part inspired rings, but check them out today at the link in the description below. Use the code VINWIKI for a discount and thank them for their support of VinWiki. It could have been worse. It could have been inverted in the ocean at night. After the fun time I had working with Fast and Furious, I thought I was pretty much done. That was my one foray into Hollywood. That was it. That I blew my old wad. I was done. So we get through that process. It was fun. It was an experience, all that kind of stuff. And they said, okay, now we're going to do Too Fast, Too Furious. Are you interested? My old boss calls me up. He basically said, hey, Craig, we're making another one. They're talking about doing a sequel. I said, you're sh me. Where do you go from this? Everybody's dead or everybody's fled town. Where are we going with this? He goes, just come up here. So I come up there and we have a discussion. And then he says, we're going to go over to the Universal uh, office. Uh, Scott Stuber was the VP of production back in those days. So I walk into this room and there's about 15 people sitting in there. It's a big, just what you think a Hollywood conference room would look like. Big oak table, lazy oval, the 15 people sitting there. John Singleton, the director of Too Fast, Too Furious, is sitting two seats down from me. Ted Mosier, who was going to be with the picture car captain, is sitting next to me. David Martyr sitting on my right and the whole staff of people are sitting there. So Melissa Kroll was the person at Universal who was in charge of product placements and relationships. She had worked out a deal with this, with Dodge and said, okay, so here's what's going on for the cars. Um, we have Dodge signed up, and I'm thinking, Viper, fuck yeah, Viper. Not a muscle car guy, but who doesn't like a Viper? And she goes, we have this car, Neon SRT4, and I'm writhing in my 
See, I'm fidgeting like this. And Singleton catches us at the corners of his eye, and he goes, Lieberman, you got a problem? You got something to say? I said, no, sir, I'll wait my turn. He goes, no, no, it's okay, you can jump in here. I said, no, no, I'll, I'll wait my turn. I'll, you know, just go into this discussion. I'll just wait. I want to hear everybody's input, and we can talk about it when we get to me. Because, listen, I don't want no booty ass shit in my movie. If this is booty, I need to know right f***ing now. And I said, well, <sighs> I turned into Robert De Niro for a second, I leaned back in my chair, only thing was missing was a cigar. And I said, well, in my humble opinion, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, look, a Dodge Neon to all car people is a rental car. It's the kind of car that you buy the insurance on knowing damn well that you're not going to swerve for any obstacles. It's a rental car. It's a hunk of shit. It's a front wheel drive. No one's going to take that car seriously. My boss, David Martyr, grabs my wrist. Did you ever see that movie, Hunt for Red October, where Alec Baldwin is talking about, he's, he's chastising the Admiral? Right, they're Jenner or whatever, and then uh, uh, James Earl Jones, right? Is that the guy's name? Darth Vader guy? He grabs Alec Baldwin's wrist like that, and I was like, okay, maybe I should just shut the f*** up at this point. This, and she says, are you telling us to turn down a, a multi-million dollar deal to put this car in there? I said, I'm not telling you that. I'm saying you can't make it the main car of the movie. On the food chain of cars, it's way down near the bottom, right above Hugo, I think. No one's going to take it seriously. John told me that he was looking for cars that are going to lend credence and credibility to the movie and keep with the franchise of being truly representative of the car scene, which was a bit of a stretch, but it was what it was. And I said, why don't we use a Dodge Viper? She said, I'm sure I could get some Vipers. We can, we can work a neon SRT4 in there as a secondary character's car. And maybe there can even be some dialogue about it. You know, like, what's wannabe car? Oh, it's got a turbo. Okay, now we can talk about that. That's fine. But you, there's no way you can put that car at the top of the franchise. And so John was like, okay, so uh, we're going to have to find these food chain of cars. And I went back up to the to the uh, grease board and I started an R34 Skyline GTR. And it was like, what's that? Who makes that? Nissan. Nissan makes a, a Skyline GTR? I've never seen one. I just happened to have one in the parking lot. <laughs> so the Motor X car I bought, the R34 was black. It was called the Blackbird. Black cars don't get magazine features. And by that time, I was doing consulting for Meguiar's. And so I turned this thing into a show car, right? So I painted it candy blue and it had this triple nitrous bottle stack system on it, had gauges everywhere. I was always wanted to be a fighter pilot. My vision sucked, so I built ricey cars. So it had the big carbon fiber wing and all this stuff. There's one seat in there and three nitrous bottles, double purges and all that. Kind of stuff. So they came and they're like, ooh, ah, ooh. What is it? What does it do? What's so, what's so special about it? So I had to kind of walk them through it and all that kind of stuff. And they said, okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll use this one. I said, oh, calm your tits for a second. Hang on, cool your jets. You gotta understand how much these cars are. And he says, well, how much did you pay for yours? I said, $78,000. And he goes, $78,000? We can do that, right? I said, well, we're not, we don't have to actually you know, use all GTRs, do we? You know, this, there's this a scene in here with the bridge jump and all that kind of, you wanna use GTRs for that? Yeah, we can do it. How many can, can you get more? So I called up Motorex. I said, I'm going to need four GTRs. What are we going to get for them? Well, we're not going to federalize them. They're going to be illegal, so, but we'll put them on an airplane. It's $48,000 for a car, each car and then $13,000 for shipping. They could put them in a, a 747 in a cargo container or however they strap cars down and move them over here from Japan. Motorex, I don't know if you know the story about Motorex, but Motorex, the guy was running at Hiro Nanayoshi. Uh, there was quite a big scandal about that. He was in the hookers and blow and just snorting lines off a hooker. I won't get into the details. It's well documented on the internet. People can find that. But he had a little problem with hostess bars. And so he tended not to take care of business. Now, a big motion picture studio with a room full of Jewish New York attorneys are ready to pounce on anybody who's not living up to their contractual agreements. So I'm basically calm. I have all the correspondence that I wrote to Hero saying, look, here's the deal. If the cars aren't here on Tuesday, you're going to court. What are you going to do? Somehow they magically showed up and we got the cars. We got the R34s. And so off to the picture car house we went and everything moved down to Florida. Started building the cars in California. We took all the old cars from Fast and Furious 1, which were literally rotting in a warehouse, a new hall glass sitting out in New Hall. All the cars were under two inches of dust. We took all the RX-7s, all the used Supras, the S2000, every car we had, the leftover Jettas, brought them all out to uh, Florida and then repainted them to do different cars, like the RX-7 that was Domus became Orange Julius's. 
the Supras became um, Slapjack's car, and so forth and so on. Being there, it was much easier now in the second movie to get parts. In the first movie, I was calling marketing directors and begging for parts. Their good graces for a movie that uh, may or may not do well at the box office. Gretti told us that their sales went up 1,500%. The guy, the owner of uh, Nitrous Oxide System is still pissed at me. Mike Thermos, I just spoke to his kid two weeks ago, saying we couldn't keep polished bottles in stock for three years. <laughs> it's all my fault. So the, we get these cars out there to Florida, and we start building all these cars, and it was a f***ing process. But picking up the phone now was really easy. Uh, hello, Nitrous Express. I need 32 carbon fiber bottles for the building of the Nitrous Systems on these R34 Skylines. All right, give me your address. You'll have them in two days. But the UPS truck is coming every day. The FedEx truck. You know how you get excited when the, the UPS truck comes down your driveway and, and drops off that part that you've been waiting for for six months or whatever? It just and We had a parts cage and a barcode system and everything. It was crazy. But this time they were building the cars for real. Uh, everything had proper parts. We needed stereo systems in the cars because John Singleton, he wanted to bring that to the, to the story. So we went to West Coast Customs and all the cars got stereos installed before they left California and went over to Florida. So we had five TVs in these cars, working nitrous systems. <laughs> all the gauges worked, neon lights on everything. There's a picture I posted on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago. There's a super up on a lift and there's a stack of used street glow boxes, literally five feet high. This guy, Pierre, I forget his last name. This guy, we worked that guy to death. That poor guy, we worked him to death. So it was interesting to watch that process, especially when the temperature was 99 degrees and 100% humidity, or your watch would fog over as soon as you walk out of the picture car warehouse. Right? It's all kinds of stuff. So being on set for that was a lot of fun, and a lot of interesting stuff going on there. When I saw Paul on set, I said, uh, you're back again? He goes, hey, they, they keep hiring me. They think I'm an actor. I'm gonna, they've got cars, surfing, or guns. I'm in. That was it. So he was all back. He goes, which one of these jalopies is yours? It's R34. He goes, oh, it's just like wine. Just like mine, it's silver and everything. He had already bought a silver R34. But the most interesting sequence was the S2000 jump over the bridge. People probably remember that. I know there was a lot of CG in, this, in the bridge jumping sequence. But in the S2000, they couldn't put a stunt person in the car because they would have to put a roll cage in the car and it would be visible on film. So they decided they were going to do a remote control system. So they had this rental Dodge Durango and they put a, looked like a PlayStation controller you know, steering wheel and pedals and all that, but it had this metal box that they had made with the RF cables and military mil-spec connectors and all that kind of stuff. There's an RF system to communicate with the remote control mechanism that was mounted inside the S2000. I have pictures of that in the video that I did. They had this thing that goes around the steering wheel and it's all anchored so that it's got leverage so it can turn the steering wheel at speed. And they had the receiver sitting on the floor in a, like a little mini Pelican case and all that kind of stuff. The catch was you had to be within 75 feet of the car or otherwise you risked losing the connection. And if you lost the connection, the car goes wherever it's pointed at whatever speed it was. The other complication was the car S2000 is only a manual transmission. There is no automatic. So it's not like you can, you know, put it down and drive and then use an electronic release for the brake or something to get the car going. Nope, 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 nope. Pneumatically, they had a lever attached to the, to the clutch pedal, so they would just rev it up in second gear and just release it, and it would take off in second gear. So the, the bridge would jump was done in second gear. Now, for that particular sequence, they actually jumped the bridge. So they acted like this and the other part of the bridge down for that car. They wanted to go far and fast, right? But what they did was they realized the angle was going to be too much. So what they did was they said, okay, this is unsafe. So although the bridge was up at about this angle, they put a ramp here. They fabricated a ramp that was about 60 feet long and about 5 feet tall, okay? And it was about 20 feet from the end of this bridge, okay? So the stunt person would be remote control the vehicle up the ramp and then get it going. It would be about 55 miles an hour, I think, was the top speed in second gear, more or less. And it would fly and then it would land. Wherever it landed is wherever it landed. That was it. And they put a dummy in the car, which... You, People who want the 4K version, if, they're, if it's out yet, they'll be able to see that's clearly a dummy. Here's the problem, though. Miami tends to be a bit humid, especially at night. Condensation forms in certain places. If you've ever been on any bridge in Miami, you know that they're traditionally steel slats. They're a thin piece of steel, maybe 3 eighths of an inch thick, and they're all bunched together and all that kind of stuff. So the water can drain right through it. The problem with that is when it gets humid, Condensation forms, and the, th the ramps are slippery. Not very good for street tires and a 4,200-pound SUV with marginal, you know, 9-inch brakes or whatever these things have. So the chase vehicle is coming up the ramp, chasing them up the ramp to go, and they go, you know, up the street, and then get onto the ramp, and the Dodge Durango has to stop. So it slams on the brake, 
doesn't quite make. Now, the S2000 goes flying off, and it does its thing, crash, land, brake, and all that kind of The problem is when they slammed on the brakes, it didn't quite stop, and I went, kush. Fortunately, since this was still bridge here, it just had fallen off the end of the ramp, but there was still bridge here, they didn't go into the ocean upside down at night, which would have been bad. Would not have been good. I can't imagine the outcome. But when it went down like that, it went square on the front bumper, and when you crash a car on the front bumper, everybody knows what happens. Airbags come out, and all that custom-mounted steering wheel stuff wound up in his lap, and supposedly he broke his wrist or wrist or injured himself. It was minor. It could have been worse. It could have been inverted in the ocean at night, strapped into a car in a Dodge Durango. So now you have to understand that this was a rental car. <laughs> They took it into the body shop. Our boss said that over with the Ford dealership had just gone out of business. Dave Martyr went over there. He's heard it was going out of business. And he said, uh, we're going to keep all you guys on. We're going to rent the property, and we're going to keep the paint shop running. You guys want to work on movie cars? Yeah, 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 yeah. We want to work on movie cars. So they had to fix that during. <laughs> Any problems with the car? No, it was great. Fantastic. <laughs> Turn it in. That was the end of that. Premier Financial Services has been a sponsor of VinWiki for the last four years, and we can't thank them enough for their support, and we love them for that, but also because their simple lease truly is a tremendous product in the world of exotic car financing. They allow you to minimize your payment, minimize your down payment, take all the tax advantages that are available for a lease, while still giving you the ability to move in and out of cars and accumulate equity. So they structure it in a very unique way that's hugely advantageous, gives you a lot more buying power, and their customer service is absolutely incredible. So we love Mitch and their team for their continued support of the channel. We thank them for that. But please visit them at the link in the description below and find out how easy it is to buy your dream car through Premier Financial Services. Most mechanics would have thrown up their middle fingers and said, get the, you know what, out of my shop. So one of the craziest questions I get, it's actually a very constant question I get anymore is, has YouTube changed how you run your shop, how you operate your shop, especially from some friends I have that also are shop owners. And the answer is, YouTube has ruined my shop. Now when I say ruined my shop, I don't mean it's a bad thing. What I mean by that is the fact that the way that a normal person thinks of how a mechanic shop runs from day-to-day -day activities compared to the way my shop runs from day-to-day -day activities is a night and day difference. My shop originally started as your average day-to-day -day shop. There were no cameras involved. It was just you bring your car, you get it fixed, you pay, and you leave. And what it is today, and I've joked with several people, other YouTubers, is it's almost become a production studio. It's probably 20 to 30 percent a mechanic shop. The rest, as far as income-wise, the way the money works, it's really a production studio. Now, how did that happen? How did it get that way? So you guys have seen already a video here on VinWiki about how YouTube got started or how I got introduced to YouTube in my life. But how it changed the shop is a completely different story altogether. It's not necessarily how it changed me as a person, but really the shop. It kind of all started in Halstead, in the, the medium-sized shop that I had in Halstead, where Tyler had gotten his YouTube channel started. This is before Car Issues Season 1. It was just Tyler and his then baby YouTube channel. It was really small at that time. And as anyone who has owned a shop or is a mechanic in a shop could imagine, having a camera in your face while you're trying to work really pisses you off. It can make you very angry. Because anyone who's run a shop for 15, 20, 30 years has a, a trained mindset of phone calls, estimates, get the cars done, we need to pay the bills, let's get these cars out of here. That does not work in my shop. It did originally. That was the original way that I ran it, but that is not the way that is ran today. There were times I actually thought, I don't know if this is going to work. I still want to run a shop. I still want to fix cars. It's, I really enjoy that, but I don't know about this whole camera thing. This is, this is crazy. Being told to take my wrench, put it back, 
take it back off, hold on, you did that wrong, put it back on, let's try a different angle, let's, let's stop what we're doing, back up, start from the beginning, put the parts back on, let's try this again. Most mechanics would have thrown up their middle fingers and said, get the, you know what, out of my shop. But again, there goes divine intervention. I thought, I felt a feeling inside myself that said, you need to put up with this, you need to, you need to work with this and make it work and find a way to integrate it into your shop. Don't put up your middle fingers. You need to make this work. It's taken time. It's taken a lot of patience, but I've found a way to make it all balance and make it all work. So it has made changes as far as the conventional way of running a shop. It has completely ruined that. But the advantages that have come along the way and then the net positive that is the result of it all is totally worth it in the end. Tyler's channel started to grow a little bit more. There were more videos, more cameras. I'm in the middle of three or four cars for your conventional everyday customer and I'm trying to figure out how to fix these cars and then my phone rings and I answer it and it's Tyler. I've got this one car, the engine doesn't start, I want to film this, I need to have it done by the end of the week, blah blah blah. What, what do I do here? How do I make this work? I, I need to keep my day-to-day -day customers happy. I don't want them to run off. You can't call a customer up and say your car is not going to be done today because we had to film, so we stopped working on your car. That's not going to work. You will get screamed at very quickly. So some of the ways that I found to balance that is I would call the customer up and say, hey, can we get another day or two to work on your car? We had some things come up. I don't exactly tell them it's filming or anything. If you need the car right away, we're happy to keep going or keep working on it, but we had something come up. It, would it be okay if I gave you a 10% discount and in order to get a day or two more out of this? And nine times out of 10, no problem. So then I'd call Tyler up and say, hey, I got some extra time. Bring the car. Let's do this. Let's get the filming done. I'll get the car running. You can film your video, and, and inadvertently it would work. He would get his video out. The gain that I received out of this is once the video went out, that's the best advertising a shop could ever have. It reaches hundreds of thousands of people nationwide. They see me working in the shop. They see the name of the shop, and they associate my shop with, at the time, a fledgling YouTube star. And just as I had got that figured out and started to make all that work, then I get a phone call from Tyler Hoover that says, we're going to film a professional show. It's going to be called Car Issues. And there is a company, Bright Bay Creative, that's going to be producing this. Do you want your shop involved? Do you think you can make this work? I could find another mechanic shop, but it would be a huge deal. I really would like to work it here with you. And I said, well, what is this, like one day a week? Or how, how is this going to work? He said, oh, no, it'll be 24 cars. And there's really no schedule. It's just kind of when the cars show up, we need to film right now and get this done. And it may take the entire day. So there was more training on my part. Do I give up? Do I throw this under the bus? Or do I figure out how to make this work? How can I integrate this? It's, it's really, it was really stressful in the beginning. Now it's, it's, I totally get it. But at the time, it was very stressful. So I started saying with customers... We are now filming, doing professional filming. We're happy to work on your car. Your car will maybe featured in the back of the video. The only downside is it may take a little longer to get your car done. But we'll work with you on the price. We'll be happy to help you out. It's just not going to be done at the snap of a finger. And I found when customers found out their car might be on a video, that totally their, their stress is gone and they think, wow, this is cool. In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to lose so much business. This is, this is going to cost me my shop. For to film a video for Tyler, that would be the average thinking of a conventional shop owner. This is going to lose me my shop. But the opposite became true. It blew up the shop. The word got around. And, Have you ever heard of Omega Auto Clinic? I was there getting my car worked on, and they were filming professional level quality studio quality videos in the shop that's going to be on TV. This guy's like, the big ticket here in the area or you know things like that pretty soon I started getting phone calls over and over and that's when the time came that I needed to hire another mechanic there goes growth that's how it works there's more money coming in I'm learning to deal with the stress of filming I'm learning to deal with balancing the schedule balancing keeping the film crew happy keeping Tyler's YouTube channel fed with content I'm starting to figure this all out. I got another mechanic hired so that I could say, here's this car, keep working on that in the background while I film. So progress is still being made on the mechanic side of the, the equation, and also progress is being made on the film side of the equation. 
when we got car issues finished and got it all done, and I thought, okay, so now I've pushed a lot of these people off, now it may slow way down. But the opposite again came to be true. Once the word got out, car issues was filmed there. There was also a news article, the, the local newspaper did an article, and they, they showed pictures of the film crew filming there. And Hoovy's Garage was also being filmed there, with those videos being out. It wasn't very long before the phone was ringing off the hook. That's when I knew I had to hire an office guy. And that's when I hired my guy, Dave, who's been with me since that day for multiple years. He's been a very, very loyal employee. But I don't think he realized at the time when he started, the original bargaining chip was that he could sell cars for me, he could answer the phones, and over time he turned into be my publicist. I don't think he ever realized that. I don't think I even realized it at the time. If you were to fast forward to today, 50 to 60% of the phone calls and contact with the public that he deals with is strictly based on the fan base. You got people driving from out of state that want to visit the wizard and say they've seen the outside of the shop. We've got people that are calling that want to speak to me that constantly, I got car questions, I got this and that. If it wasn't for Dave in the office, it wouldn't be possible. And I don't think I could hire someone today to be a, re a receptionist that would even understand how this all works or to be able to meld it all together. He's able to do it because over time, slowly, he has worked out his methods to make it all work. When the phone rings and he picks up the phone, it could be a fan or it could be a customer or both. You don't really know and he doesn't really know. So that has to be ascertained every time the phone rings. We'd like to thank Auto Tempest for their support of this month's videos on VinWiki. Auto Tempest is the best place to find your next car, whether it's your dream car or your next project, anything you want to look for, it's the most powerful tool to search all the major listing sites at the same time. They give you much more specific search criteria. They are the supporter of Car Trek, and we cannot thank them enough for that. But this is now their fourth year of sponsoring the VinWiki channel. So be sure to thank them now by checking out the link in the description below to search for your next car. Autotempest.com, all the cars, one search. When I told my wife that I was buying Paris Hilton's car, she got really excited. As much time as I honestly do spend on Auto Tempest each day looking for new cars for sale, over the last few months I've been really, really happy with the cars that I have. I've been driving them, enjoying them, and I did buy another car for Car Trek 4, which will come out in May. And if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have already seen some previews of that series. We had an absolute blast. But a few weeks ago, just out of the blue, I got a message from Tyler Hoover, and it was a listing for a 2006 Mercedes McLaren SLR that was coming up for sale. And it was in a unique spec, but more significantly than that, based on its previous owner, it was a car that could very justifiably be called the most famous McLaren ever built. And I expected him to be telling me that he was going to go buy this car because both of us have talked about how much we do love the SLR. And in fact, though, he said, no, I can't. I just bought these two Lamborghinis, the Diablo Roadster and the Countach that we've seen on his channel. He said, yeah, I, I can't buy it right now, but I was thinking about making a video just about how cool the car's history is. And I was like, well, man, I don't think we should let this one get away. I think I'll try to buy it if you're not going to. So it became the perfect opportunity to work on a new sponsor relationship because I wasn't exactly in a position to comfortably buy the car either. And I met Rich Light from Glossit last year on Gold Rush where I actually spent about a thousand miles driving another participant's SLR McLaren. And I loved the car. I had an absolute blast. I kind of got to learn what it was like on the real twisty roads and obviously bombing through big highway routes as well. And so Rich had given everybody on the rally some of his gloss enhancer detail spray. And each night we would use that to kind of clean the cars up and wipe the dust that had accumulated from the prior day's driving. And I really came to like it. it for somebody who's lazy like me and can get a car clean you know, once in a while or have somebody help with that, but really just needs a way to keep it looking as good as it possibly can after some long driving, the stuff's really good. It's just a great quick detail spray, easy to get on, easy to get off. And so I really came to like it. And Rich and I had been talking for the last few months about different ways that Glossit and VinWiki might be able to collaborate. And so he hadn't been quick enough to sign up for one of our monthly placements for 2021 on VinWiki, which are already sold out. But when this came 
came up, I called him, I said, hey, I think I have the perfect thing for us to work on. And he said, man, that sounds great. I can make a series detailing the car. And I was kind of surprised at that. He said, no, let me intercept the truck that'll be bringing it to you from Los Angeles. I'll do everything we can to make the car look perfect. And this worked perfectly because I was going to be out filming Car Trek as the car was being shipped. I'll spend a few days with the car and then we'll send it on to you. I said, well, that sounds great. And he ended up doing a 100 hour detail and he's going to have a series on his YouTube channel, kind of documenting everything that they did with the car. But obviously now it is at a point perfectly corrected, perfectly prepared, that I truly can just use this to keep it looking great. And in honor of that relationship and to celebrate it, he has agreed to give any of our viewers a free bottle of their Gloss Enhancer Detail Spray. You just visit them at the link in the description below, sign up, and they'll send you one. All you have to do is pay the shipping and handling. And so it's a great product. There's a lot of good quick detail sprays on the market, but Gloss it sells everything that you could possibly need to detail a car. But to be honest, this is exactly the kind of thing that somebody like me needs. So please visit them at the link in the description below, get your free bottle, and thank them for their support of VinWiki. But the car is a 2006 SLR McLaren. It's gray with a tan interior, and I absolutely love it. Of course, the SLR has kind of a strange reputation, and it's gotten criticized by a lot of people for three major things. The handling is strange, the braking is strange, and the transmission is clunky. And all of those criticisms are kind of right, particularly relative to a lot of the cars that it lined up against. Now, when the car came out, the SLR and really all the other supercars of the day weren't called hypercars. That wasn't a word that came up until really late in the 2000s, 2010, and really became more mainstream in 2013 and 14 to describe the 918, the P1, and the LaFerrari. But certainly now we use the word hypercar a lot to talk about Pagani's and Koenigsegg's and really any ultra low production ultra high performance car. But I think like most enthusiasts, when I heard Richard Hammond refer to the SLR as hypercar royalty, when it was drag racing in Abu Dhabi, the LP670 Mercy SV, I kind of looked, I was like, the, the what? Hypercar royalty? So I, I don't really think of it as a hypercar. It was most certainly the greatest car that Mercedes and McLaren could come together to build in the mid-2000s. And obviously, I'm a huge fan of cars in the mid-2000s. I always say that I like to look like I won the lottery 10 or 15 years ago, and that's why I own and love the cars that I do. And so this fits in really well, because it's one of the cars that would have been shopped heavily against an LP640 when it was new. I love the LP640, but this kind of solves that big, crazy, grand touring, highway bombing car in a different way. You know, those criticisms were somewhat valid. It handles like a Batmobile. The hood is eternally long, the steering feel is a little bit strange, and it feels very much like a German Mercedes AMG product where they didn't care as much about it feeling as refined. The noises that it makes, everything about the car is just dialed up to 11. The braking is also super duper strange. They're very early generation ceramic brakes, and honestly, they rely on the rear spoiler acting as an air brake to have the car stop the way that you feel like it probably ought to. And also, the transmission is weird. It's weird to have a clunky five-speed automatic transmission with a torque converter in a car that looks, feels, and sounds like an SLR does. However, when we look at owning the cars now, and not having an early single clutch sequential manual transmission, which is what it would have had, because they, they were never gonna put a stick in this car. I have to say, I love it. It's the same transmission that's in the CL55 that we set the cannonball record in. It's the same transmission that's in the $2,000 S55 that I'm gonna shoot off a cliff in Alaska. It's one of those things that it's just such a bulletproof part of the car that when you're trying to own an aging supercar or hypercar, if you want to call it that, that's one of the things that should scare you. It's all these transmissions that were built at the bleeding edge of technology at the time, they're huge ownership liabilities now. And knowing that I can trust the transmission in this car makes me feel a whole lot better about the cost of ownership. Of course, the SLR also has the reputation of having catastrophically high servicing costs, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in future videos, but you know, there's a lot of people that can work on them now, and there's a lot of great dealership infrastructure to try to make it easier to put more miles on the car. Now, this car actually has some miles on it. I think it's the highest mileage SLR that I've ever put hands on. I mean, there are some that have had 30 or 40, 50,000 miles, but this one has 21,000 miles, so it has absolutely been driven, and I'll say it has the best feeling brakes that I've ever been in one. The one that I drove on Gold Rush 
handled strangely and braked in a really, really strange way, even more so than usual. So this one drives a lot more like my CL55 or an SL55 of the day would brake. And so it hasn't upset me and I haven't gotten that normal SLR feeling that I'm about to roll into whatever is in front of me because that's something that you always feel like is gonna happen. Again, I love the SLR. I'd always been interested in owning an SLR. I talked a lot about why I like the SLR in the video from Gold Rush last year, and I actually tried to buy one that was in a flood that I got outbid by a guy that sent it to Saudi Arabia. And so I've always thought the car was really, really cool, both in what it stands for for McLaren and for Mercedes and in how you can drive and use the car. It is a daily drivable supercar. And so again, the reason that this one is famous though is not based on anything that applies to all SLRs. It's famous because this one belonged to Paris Hilton. And even more than that, it is the most famous McLaren on earth, I think very justifiably, because of one night that it had. Now Paris Hilton in the mid 2000s was the hottest thing on earth. She was associated with every pop icon there ever could have been and she was famous for being on The Simple Life and obviously being an heiress to the Hilton Hotel's fortune and certainly she was out spending money lavishly and she was as famous as anybody could have been at that time, particularly for another video that happened one night in her life that she may or may not have wanted to be on the internet but certainly helped her rise to stardom. And interestingly, when I told my wife that I was buying Paris Hilton's car, she got really excited, like in a very unexpected way. And I was like, are you a big Paris Hilton fan? And then it occurred to me, no, but like Kimmy, my wife was apparently enamored and enthralled with the pink West Coast customized Bentley Continental GT that Paris was very famous for owning. She's like, you bought the pink Bentley? I said, no, no, I did not. I bought her SLR, which interestingly, she was still a little bit excited about because my wife knew that it had a real automatic transmission. And while I've tried to get her comfortable with driving a stick, that's never really worked. And so she was like, I might want to drive that car. I said, well, you are certainly welcome to. Of course, like we said, the handling is weird. The overhang is impossible to know where the nose is at. And so we'll help her be careful with that. But I'm very excited at the prospect that she might want to put some miles on the car. And so again, Paris was at this time associated with everybody who was anybody in Southern California. And one night she went out to some clubs and I think the Beverly Hills Hotel with Britney Spears. And Britney Spears certainly was kind of at those last couple of years before her very public meltdown. And this car in fact was in the recent New York Times documentary about her life. This car on that night was certainly going to have an interesting time. And so Paris and Britney have been going out and at one point, either in getting into or out of the car, Britney Spears manages to flash the entire world by way of a hundred paparazzi cameras. And as famous as Gordon Murray or Lewis Hamilton or El Chapo's drug runners might be able to make a McLaren, that all applies to the very narrow niche of automotive enthusiasts. This was an international stage, and no matter what they could do, they could never make a car as famous as the unsheathed undercarriage of one pop icon, Britney Spears. And in fact, when you see her get into this car on video, because the whole thing got caught on video, you see her kind of realize what she may have just done. And of course, those pictures took absolutely no time to make their way around the world. And in fact, every single person that I have mentioned that I bought this car claims to have seen those photos. And those photos, particularly the ones later on in the night where they had gone to some club, they had come out, and the paparazzi were asking Paris about a relationship that she had with Lindsay Lohan, where apparently, according to a podcast that Paris released just last week, they had had some kind of a feud where Lindsay had said perhaps that Paris had hit her or something like that. And they're talking and Lindsay Lohan just walks up in an unexpected seeming way and ends up just getting into the car. And so she and Britney Spears are both sitting in the passenger seat of this car, Paris is driving, and you have some of the most iconic 2000s photos you could ever imagine. All those photos have been seen everywhere. In fact, they make sunshades of the three of them sitting in the car that you can buy for a normal car. I ordered one, it's not here yet, but obviously I have to have one to put into this car. And so I am by no means a fan of popular culture. I'm not even a knower of what popular culture is most days, but this is a car that has been without question seen by more people than any other McLaren ever built. And I think that's really cool. Is it enough to make me buy a car that I wasn't necessarily planning to? Sure. Would it have made me buy a car that I didn't already want to? Probably not. 
There's plenty of celebrity cars that have that interesting backstory that you know you could say that about. But regardless, I wanted an SLR. I love the spec and the color combination on this one, and I was really, really excited to buy it. So I'm very, very happy that Tyler told me about it. I'm happy that Glossit was able to support us, and I hope that you will visit their website to get your free bottle of their Gloss Enhancer Detail Spray. It is a really, really good product, and honestly, I couldn't have bought this car without them. And so I definitely appreciate that. This car had many, many more interesting nights in its relationship and ownership under Paris Hilton, and I'll talk more about those in some future stories. But I gotta say, after driving it a good bit, I love it. I, I think it's gonna be a long-term fixture in the stable. I gotta put some tires on it. The tires that were on it were 11 years old, one of them installed inside out. So it's gonna do that. It's about to pass emissions and hopefully get a license plate here in the great state of Georgia easier than most of my cars have been in their recent acquisition. But you know, it doesn't have a bunch of lights on. It seems to be behaving itself and I can't wait to put many more miles and maybe even add some more interesting stories. I'm not sure that's realistic. I don't think I'll ever top that, but I will certainly enjoy it and have a lot of fun and put many more interesting miles on this SLR. Okay, why didn't you call me three engines ago? So I'm an attorney and I specialize in lemon law. I've been practicing lemon law for 30 years. Uh, my office is not far from Detroit, so we've got the big three right there. Uh, they love me, I've been suing them for 30 years. So people often ask me about the lemon law, what is it, how does it work? But then they also say, are there really that many bad cars out there? And I say, oh yeah, in fact, it's, you know, it's kept me busy for 30 years. People go, well, lawyers file lawsuits. How bad can these cars be? Well, let me give you some examples. I had a client once whose little Dodge, the little Daytonas they came out with in the late 80s, early 90s, went through seven engines, seven engines. The guy calls me up and says, hey, Steve, I got a car. I think it's a lemon. I go, why is it? And he goes, it's on its seventh engine right now. And I said, okay, why didn't you call me three engines ago? But the point is that he came into my office and he puts the repair orders on my desk. You can't argue with the repair orders. Engine blows up, replaced. Engine blows up, replaced. Seven engines. And so I filed a lawsuit on this and Chrysler buys it back instantly. They pay my attorney fees, so everyone's happy. Everyone wins. And then you might ask yourself, but wait a second, why would a brand new car go through seven engines? And then you understand one of the reasons that lemons exist. It's not that the car was bad. It's not that the engines were bad. There's no way that they actually grabbed replacement engines at random and they were all bad. There was something else going on. And I've spoken to people who are zone reps, who represent the factories and interface with the dealerships. And I've spoken to mechanics. And I've spoken to all these different people at different levels in these dealerships. And they say, here's the problem with modern corporate automotive America. Dealership sells a car. Car comes back for warranty work. The manufacturer is going to pay for the warranty work. But they will only authorize so much work for, oh, I don't know, diagnosis and, and, and analysis. And then when it comes to actually doing the repair. So they can't just say, we want to do this or we want to do that. They got to call and get it approved. And what was happening in that particular case was there was something else that was causing problems and they were replacing the short block only. So a short block for the non-car guys in the audience is the middle part of the engine and is the stuff that gets attached to the short block. And it can vary from engine to engine, but they might, for instance, be taking parts off the old engine and putting them on the short block for the new engine. And the part that they're putting on could be what's causing the engine failure. So somebody, somewhere, looking at this warranty history as this car comes in over and over again, should have said, wait, there's no way that this guy got two engines, three engines, four engines in a row that are bad. But what happened was the mechanic would go, well, it's got a blown engine. He'd call to get some work authorized. They go, you get 15 minutes of diagnosis, throw in another short block. He should have said, wait a second, short block ain't gonna do it because you keep blowing up short blocks. For whatever reason, that call either didn't get made or didn't get approved. So somewhere down the road, they buy this vehicle back after it's gone through seven engines. But the point is, car was a lemon. What caused that vehicle to become a lemon? Well, there was something wrong with the original engine, but it was not diagnosed properly. So interestingly enough, the manufacturer is who's gonna buy a vehicle back in a lemon law, not the dealership. So sometimes you'll find that dealerships 
don't even really care if your vehicle becomes a lemon. I actually know a guy who is a service manager at a major dealership in Michigan who's got a stack of my business cards. And he hands them out to people and they walk up very casually and go, by the way, call this guy, your car's a lemon. So it happens. The thing about the lemon law is it's very specific. Your vehicle's got to be in the shop so many times within so many years. And it varies from state to state. All 50 states have got lemon laws. So in some states, it's got to be in the shop, like Michigan, four times basically that it cannot be repaired. But the first time within the first year, and then all four within the first two years. So if your first defect occurs at day 366, it's not going to qualify as a lemon. Very, very specific things like that. Now, if the car's got a warranty and it's got a problem, there's other laws that cover it, like the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. But the point is that lemons have these very, very specific designations like that. So, for instance, I had a client driving on the freeway in Detroit, and the steering wheel of his brand new car fell off in his lap. So he very quickly jams it back on and pulls the car to the side of the road. And as he regains his composure, as we say, you know, what's he going to do now? So he shuts the car off and it's before cell phones. Walks, calls a dealership. The dealership comes and gets it. And they go, oh, yeah, your steering wheel fell off because a, a nut came undone. We tightened it for you. Well, now, my client doesn't want to drive that car again, rightfully so, because he almost died the last time he did because the steering wheel fell off in his lap. Guess what? One repair attempt. And in Michigan, that's not a lemon law claim. Now, there, again, are other laws that we pursued it and we actually did get the car bought back. But some states have a third prong. So the first prong is it spends four times in the shop first two years. Second prong is it spends 30 days in the shop in the first year. Third prong in some states is if it has multiple failures of a safety-related system. So your brakes fail a couple times. That might be a lemon in some states. Your steering wheel falls off in your lap. The scary part is it's got to happen more than once. So, you know, I, I would have a hard time as an attorney advising you, take it out. If it falls off again, call me back. That's a defective car. A lot of people call that a lemon, but it's not a lemon in the truest sense of Michigan's lemon law. I get phone calls about a lot of defective products. And there was actually a point in time where I would represent anybody if they called me with a defective product I'd never handled before. So I've represented people who've bought cars, trucks, snowmobiles, personal watercraft, ATVs, sewing machines, things of that nature. So I get a lot of phone calls about RVs. And, and I got bad news for the people out there who are thinking about buying their first RV. Don't, unless you really know what you're getting into. RVs in most states do not have lemon law coverage. You can drop six figures on an RV. It can cost more than your house. And you can drive it down the road with no lemon law coverage in most states. So I've had people buy quarter of a million dollar RVs that don't run. $150,000 RVs that leak whenever it rains. Bad news about an RV is it tends to be parked outdoors. So the rain is a problem. I had a guy who bought a quarter of a million dollar RV that caught on fire if he drove it over 50 miles an hour. So he's driving down the road, he just bought this thing brand new, and people are pulling alongside of him, honking and pointing, which is not a good thing when people are doing that to you on the road. So he pulls over to the side of the road, he gets out, and there's smoke coming off of the rear axle of this gigantic quarter of a million dollar motorhome. So it's smoke, but it's smoldering, it's not actually burning in that sense. It was something to do with the bearings. So I think he may have hit it with a fire extinguisher, but I don't know. And then he calls the manufacturer and goes, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, what do I do? They go, bring it to one of our facilities. He goes, well, it starts smoking when I do 50. And they go, well, drive it slower. So he brings it into a repair facility that's authorized to repair these vehicles. They tear the axle apart and they go, yeah, there's a bearing back there. It's smoke. We'll replace the bearing for you. They replace the bearings, put it all back together again, paid for by the manufacturer, gets in it, starts driving down the road start smoking again. He went through that process several times and discovered he could never drive it over 50 without the axle smoking. So he would call the manufacturer up and goes, guys, this is not acceptable. They go, why? And he goes, every time I drive it over 50, the axle starts smoking? They go, well, every time you've complained, we fixed it. And their position was, if it happens again, we'll fix it. Because the cost of slapping in a new set of bearings wasn't that much. The problem is it wasn't the bearings. It was something else where the bearings are seated, it could have been something with the axle, I don't know. But that's not your job as a consumer to figure that stuff out. So we had to file a lawsuit on that, and we actually got that and worked out in court also. But the funny thing was that in litigation, we have to hire an expert mechanic, I know a certified master who inspects vehicles for me. He figured the problem out almost instantly. He goes, it's not the bearings, he goes, the axle's screwed up. And it came out that the RV manufacturer that builds the house unit doesn't build the chassis. The chassis comes from a separate manufacturer. So it winds up being that there's three different defendants and they're all pointing their fingers at each other. And that happens a lot, unfortunately, with complex 
things like that. Lemon Law also does not cover commercial vehicles. I've had people buy six-figure over-the-road trucks, owner-operators who bought their own truck with their own money, and the things break down, and they say, oh, bring it back in, we'll work on it. Yeah, but when you're working on it, I'm not making any money. Oh, that's too bad. We, we had you sign a disclaimer at the front end of this saying you can't sue us for lost wages. And guess what? The guy's got the thing in the shop for months at a time while they're working on it, trying to fix it, and, you know, that's the problem you got. I had a guy who bought a car, a used car, young man, recently married, young family, working very, very hard, but he was a little hard up financially, and he bought a used car from a very, very reputable car dealer in uh, Oakland County, just north of Detroit, Michigan. And he came out the car one day, and he couldn't get the door open on the driver's side. So he walks around the passenger side, can't get that door open either. It's kind of strange. And so he had just bought the vehicle, but it was used. See, and Lemon Law does not cover used cars. But he's got to get something done here. He needs the car to get to and from work. So he calls up the dealership. They go, well, we just sold you the car. We'll take a look at it. They tow the car in, and they give him a little bit of a run, run around. And finally they go, well, you know, the car was traded into us, and it's not covered by any warranty, but um, we can show you what's wrong with it. And, of course, it was a car that had been Frankensteined. It was cut at the firewall. The front end was from one car. The back end was from another car. And somebody had gone to a junkyard and said, hey, wait a second. That front end will fit that back end. Bought both cars, sawed them in half, welded them together. And once you popped the hood and looked, you could see the weld that went all the way around inside there, basically, holding the front end and the back end together. And, of course, as you drive it over time, as those welds start to break, the car starts to do this and you can't open the doors. And the scary part about that, of course, is the dealership goes, well, we sold it to you as is. You can't go after us. Then the problem, of course, is there's some other issues with, you know, but the guy who traded it in. Um, we wound up actually getting that vehicle bought back because there's laws like misrepresentation and fraud and so on. of People who don't disclose things that they knew or should have known. And the question is, does the dealership really not notice that a car has been cut in half and stuck together again? And the funny thing is, when I saw that case, when I saw that car, I actually saw the car with my own eyes, I remember thinking, like, wow, who, who does something like this? <laughs> and after talking about it with people, I've had people say, oh, I've heard of that before. It's not that uncommon. So there are guys out there who are very, very talented mechanically who can do these kinds of things. And there's other guys who go, yeah, and if we do this, we can sell it and make a bunch of money. The question, of course, is whether those hold, uh, the, whether the welds are going to last or not. One of the other crazier things in my career is I've handled hundreds if not thousands of lemon law lawsuits i've actually represented several people more than once where they actually bought a bad car a few years later they bought another bad car it's very unusual most cars are not lemons so that doesn't happen very often but on one occasion i represented the same truck twice and a client of mine bought a brand new ford pickup truck it had some problems and ford very very quickly bought it back thank you very much paid my client off paid my attorney fees everyone's happy a few months goes by and I get a really cryptic phone call. A woman goes, hi, I'm calling you um, about a used truck I just bought. And I started to tell her, the Lemon Law does not cover used trucks. She goes, well, you're going to want to hear about this one. I go, why is that? She said, because it was owned by your former client. And she tells me the name of my client. I said, how did you know that? She goes, well, the truck's got all kinds of mechanical problems, as you know. And uh, I took it to the dealership that I bought it from. And one of their write-up people pulled me aside and said, uh, I'm not sure how you got this truck, but that truck was just bought back under the Lemon Law. And I eventually figured this out, but the way most car companies work, at least at that time in Michigan, if they bought something back under the Lemon Law, they would buy it back, and Michigan does not brand titles as Lemon Law buybacks. Some states do, maybe 12 states, but Michigan does not. The manufacturers would take those bought back lemons to an auction and sell them to car dealers. It was a closed auction only for car dealers. And they would ship the car with a notice saying this vehicle was bought back under the Lemon Law. Here's what was wrong with it. Here's what we did to fix it. And they'll extend the warranty on that. And that's supposed to travel with the vehicle. And so this vehicle got bought at auction by the same dealership that had sold it the first time. So they got to sell the same vehicle a second time. So there's a thing in the law that says at a corporation like that, the business, the dealership, they've got knowledge. They knew this thing was a lemon law buyback. They didn't disclose that to buyer number two. But they also didn't give her the document saying this is a lemon law buyback. So in doing so, they broke their agreement with Ford as part of their dealership agreement. So I got to call up a buddy of mine at the time in the legal department at Ford and say, guess what? I got the same vehicle. You got to buy it back a second time. And I've had people say, but Steve, it's not their fault. 
Well, no, but they're going to get the money back from the dealership because the dealership broke the agreement because the agreement was if you buy this vehicle from us at this auction and resell it, you must pass along this document. And I later spoke to my guy and I said, I'm curious what happened. And he goes, when they returned the documents to Ford to indicate that this vehicle had been sold to a second buyer, that document was mysteriously left blank. And he goes, I think they were doing it to make it look like we'd notified her and we just forgot to fill out the paperwork. If you get a speeding ticket or other traffic citation, don't just pay it. It can involve costly insurance premium increases, points on your license, possible suspensions, and a lot of other inconveniences. And when you fight it, you want the right people on your side. That means finding a local lawyer to wherever you got the ticket, even if it's in your backyard or on a road trip or wherever, off the record is the best way to find the best attorney. They pair you with a local attorney wherever you get the ticket to fight for you and achieve the best outcome. In most cases, you won't even have to appear. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below and download their free app. You just take a picture of your ticket and they handle the rest. So be sure to check them out and thank them for their support of VinWiki. We end up settling on two and a half million dollars for what I believe is the greatest car ever built. Early in December of last year in 2020, I released a video kind of chronicling at that point my nine month hunt for the missing McLaren F1 in Mexico. Chassis 39, the brown over red with gold wheels car that was tied to El Chapo. It was owned by the now deceased Humberto Ojeda, AKA El Robachivas, AKA the Goat Thief, AKA Ricardo Beltran, AKA El Vito de la Loma, AKA El Chapo's most prolific drug trafficker, having moved over 220 tons of cocaine and made over $300 million in the 90s. Killed in 1997 in a shootout with his car, over 200 times his gold-plated armored Jeep Grand Cherokee was shot and one bullet snuck in through the keyhole and killed him, but not before he could drive his son, who was also in the car, to safety. And at that point, Ojeda had not told anyone in his family or anybody else where the keys were to his McLaren F1, so they hide the car from the government, from the cartel, from everybody else. And so I made a video a couple weeks later with kind of an update on it because immediately following the release of the video, I get thousands of messages with the whereabouts of the car, or at least people's thoughts, clues, things like that, but nothing super duper concrete. And so that video releases right at the end of the year, along with some other updates about things that had happened at VinWiki in 2020. And I always try to do that at the end of the year with just the little pieces and tidbits about some of the stories, th lessons learned and things like that. And I knew that headlining it with the El Chapo McLaren F1 would help the views and it did. It got 10 times more views than the one in 2019 or 2018 did. And so, but I almost didn't release that video because a day or two prior to that, I had been contacted by two separate people with very similar reports of where the car was and that it was going to be available for sale. And I, I wanted to make sure that that video didn't compromise that, but uh, it was a pretty compelling thing, mostly because of two pieces of information. Both of them indicated that the father of Ojeda had the car. And again, about half of the reports that I had heard indicated that, that it was being stored in a barn in Camino Real near Culiacan and that it was you know, still in pretty decent shape but not consistent with the other rumors that said that the son had it, had figured out a way to make it run and was driving it around periodically. And so again, I don't wanna recap everything in those two videos, but around that time, I'm talking to this guy. And that was interesting because it was also consistent with probably the most concrete piece of information that I had gotten immediately following the release of the first video, literally an hour or so later, I get a call from a prolific South Florida car collector who claimed that in early 2020, he had made an offer of $7 million to buy this car. Of course, my immediate question was, well, who did you make the offer to? And he said, well, they had remitted the offer through a French painter who they had heard about through his lawyer. He did some business in Mexico. So he had a lawyer in Mexico who had represented the family in some matters, the cartel family, and that somehow the father had sort of granted access to this French painter to see the car. Because in the same way that it had been my goal to find and one day own this car, this painter just wanted to see it long enough to create a painting of it, the Emile Bure approach. And so I was very excited to hear more about it. But really the only thing that they had seen is that the painter had shown the 
lawyer a cell phone video. Not sent the cell phone video, but shown it on their phone. And it had been very good resolution, certainly taken very recently. And the car was, as described, and in pretty decent shape. Uh, it did not look mobile, apparently, in that video. But regardless, this was an interesting clue that once again pointed to the father having it. And so both of these people contacted me, and one of them claimed to be the previous husband or significant other of Ojeda's sister. And so again, she was saying that the father had it. And this person claimed to have seen it about 10 years ago. And they said at the time, there was some damage to the front of the car. So the car had been able to be driven at some point, but wasn't being driven anymore because it had been slightly crashed. Not catastrophically, but that the front end needed to be redone and that the car was entirely being repainted at the time. So, well, that's pretty interesting. Not entirely consistent with the painter theory, but who knows? Nobody, again, has really given me proof that they know where the car is. But they sent me a picture that I had not seen before, and it was cropped very uniquely. And it was cropped in such a way that you couldn't see the front license plate. And that was where the most interesting piece of information from this report came. They claimed that the car was legally registered in Mexico, and that in that picture there was a Mexican license plate that had obviously been cropped out. I said, well, Okay. The most interesting thing about that is that if the Mexican government allows the car to be registered, means they know generally where it is, and they aren't out there trying to seize the car. Because that had always been my concern, and really the concern of anybody who's ever chased the car, that if you were to bring it into the U.S., which you could do very easily after it's 25 years old, which would either be late last year if it was built in late 95, or early this year it was built in early 96, which we think it was late 95. But my first request to this guy is, can you send me the plaque that shows when the car was built? And so he's told me that his daughter was going to be getting more pictures of the car because he was not currently in Sinaloa, she was. But again, if the car is legally registered, then they have documentation that would show that, which he was claiming to be trying to produce. And it meant that I could probably own the car without having it be seized. Because in the US, if you own something that was previously tied to drugs or illicit activity or fraud or anything like that, it can always be subject to seizure to kind of be sold to reimburse those you may have harmed or those who may have been harmed through it even if you weren't involved. And so it was one of the fears that I had discussed with this car collector in South Florida. And he said, yes, in fact, in understanding that with his lawyers, he actually, if he was able to buy it, was never going to bring it to the US, which was kind of disheartening because I mean, certainly I would want to own it here, but he said he would probably send it and go drive it in European countries that viewed circumstances like that a little bit more favorably, you might say. And so I've gotten a lot of information that is new and unique about the car from this person claiming to be Ojeda's father, and he says that he wants to sell the car for $5 million. And of course, at this point, I haven't gotten nearly enough information about the car to really be able to say what I thought it was worth, but I said, based on what I believed I knew about it, I thought it was worth $2 million. And so after some back and forth and some shrewd negotiations, we end up settling on $2.5 million for what I believe is the greatest car ever built. I'm excited about that. Again, I don't have that amount of money. I don't know exactly where I'm going to get it. I'll sell most of my cars and get the biggest car loan imaginable, but I'm confident that I can find some way to put that together. But he claims, again, that his daughter's going to be sending us pictures from wherever the car is currently being stored and, I guess, kind of painted. And so I couldn't be any more excited. And about a day later, he sends me a document. And he claims that this is the Mexican title for the car, but it's on what looks to be McLaren letterhead. And the McLaren logos use the font that McLaren used in the 90s. However, it has the speed mark, the red kind of upside down Nike swoosh that McLaren uses in their branding that is a little bit of the later version. So it's, it's strange, but again, I'm just kind of glancing through an entirely Spanish document. The only thing that I can see very clearly is that it's somehow an invoice for about 450,000 Mexican pesos, which at the time is about 23,000 US dollars. Now, that would not be a reasonable amount to pay for an annual registration. It wasn't apparently for a part or anything. It wasn't for the key, but and obviously it wasn't for the car. And so I don't really know what it's for. I sent it to some Spanish-speaking friends, and they're like, well, it does have information about a car and a client and information, but, it, but it's not really a bill for anything. And so, again, they're claiming that it's the title. As I continue to look at it, there's some really red flags about it. Uh, it one of the logos uses the more modern McLaren font. The others use the old one. It, it's weird, okay? But 
all right, they've got something, and it has the real VIN of the car. It was the only document that I had ever seen that had the VIN of the car. This is the VIN that I got using the registration plate that has still been rolling around on GTR06R, that if you do use a British information source that gives you the full VIN, it shows you the full VIN of 039. There's lots of people that have sent me these reports that, well, most of the MOT data and the British registration data says that the brown car was repainted to yellow around 2005 and that they are the same car, but 06R absolutely has a different VIN. They are not the same car. It was not repainted. 039 is still in Mexico by every single report that has any teeth. And so I know that that's the full VIN. That's what's on there. But at that point, they could have just gotten it from the video that I had released a few weeks prior. So suspicious as it might be, it's still the most intriguing thing ever because I have agreed to buy my favorite car that's ever been built. And so we continue to talk a little bit, but his English is pretty broken. I'm running it through Google Translate. I'm trying to translate what I'm telling him. And so it's just casual discussion until you know, we're waiting on his daughter to get the pictures. And each day there's a delay. Each day he promises he's gonna have them later or whatever. And so finally he sends me a picture. And that's where the ball kind of drops because it was obviously a McLaren F1 kit car. It certainly looks like a McLaren F1, but every panel is a little bit wrong, as kit cars tend to be. And I'm just heartbroken because I'm like, all right, obviously this guy is trying to scam me. But which becomes potentially a more interesting story. And so I asked for more information. I'm like, all right, well, let's get some more pictures. And even this one was such low resolution that it was obviously cropped out of something else. And I'm like, you know, guys, what's going on? Let's, let's get some real pictures of this car. It cannot be that hard. We've all got phones in our pockets with cameras on them. Send me what you can. And so he's like, all right, I'm gonna get you some more. And of course they never come. So obviously I'm kind of heartbroken because this is the red flag of all red flags. Certainly this is not the car. It's not a real McLaren F1 that they put some kit car bumper on because they couldn't get a real bumper from the factory. In fact, it looked like one of the kit cars that a Polish man named Jacek Mazur, and I'm sure I've said that incorrectly, made about 10 years ago. And he got a lot of press about it because it was a McLaren F1 looking kit car. He had made Lamborghini kit cars, Ferrari kit cars, and things like that. And he had garage built from scratch what looked to be a McLaren F1-ish thing. And so it drove around. I think he built several. One of them actually used a BMW V12. And so cool, whatever. He had this car. But, you know, this guy doesn't have one of the kit cars. And he didn't even give me more pictures of the same kit. And so regardless, I know at this point, all right, we're not talking about the car that I really want but I still want to get as much information out of this guy as I possibly can. And he keeps telling me he's going to produce more pictures. And he sends me a very low resolution picture of the center console of an F1, which would have the build plaque. And he says, there it says 039, but it doesn't say that. It doesn't say anything. You can't read it. And so that was from a different car. And so I'm getting a little bit of information and there's no real explanation about some of the inconsistencies about this document that he'd sent earlier. He still claims that's the title. Doesn't send another thing that would be more convincing as a title. So regardless, I pretty much now know this is a scam. And so we're going back and forth and he still says, well, I'm gonna send you some more pictures. And then he says, nope, I'm not gonna send you any more pictures. In fact, I need a deposit to go any further. Well, what kind of a deposit would you like, sir? And I think he wanted a couple hundred thousand dollars. I said, well, how about $50,000? Which obviously I was not gonna send. He said, okay, but when is your mechanic gonna come down and inspect it? I said, well, where would you like him to come? He says, no, I just want him to fly into Sinaloa, this airport's in Culiacan, and we'll pick him up, but he'll be safe. We'll protect him. I said, oh, would you? Okay, well, maybe I'll just come with him. He said, okay, with more the merrier. Please come down. Let me know how we can wrap this thing up. And I said, well, obviously, if I was to buy this car, it would be my lawyer to your lawyer, escrow, contingent on the car, crossing the border into the U.S., or you need to get it to Texas, and then I'll pick it up there, and you'll get the money then. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, and, you know, inevitably, this deal was going to be weird, no matter how it ever came together. But it was entertaining for me to hear exactly what he said. And I said, well, how about you send me a picture of the engine? I said, that's a harder thing to fake. I said, what you've sent me looks suspiciously like a kit car. And he was only a little bit offended by that. Not nearly as offended as you should be if you're trying to keep up this sham. But um, I'm asking the other guys, I'm like, are we all on the same page that this guy's trying to pretend that this kit car is? And they're, they're trying to say face, oh, I don't know what's going on. And maybe, you know... 
Okay, whatever. And so he says, all right, I'm gonna send you a picture of the engine, but that's the last thing that I'm gonna send until you send me a deposit. He sends what would be like the third or fourth Google image result if you were to Google McLaren F1 engine and it's totally removed from a car. It was actually from some detailer's blog who had the honor of detailing a McLaren F1 engine. Certainly not the real thing. Came off of some Pinterest cache or something like that. And so I said, all right, thank you so much. I appreciate your ability to search the internet for pictures that might be compelling as part of this car's case, but either way, I, I won't be sending you a deposit. I won't be visiting you to inspect this kit car, but thank you so much. And there had been some other reports of kit cars being floating around in Mexico. So one on a trailer, one in a warehouse, and one like April Fool's joke that some Instagram account had composed. But regardless, I did not find the car. And uh, again, most of the other reports had said that Ojeda's son has it. He's all grown up now. He spends most of his time in New York City. I made some efforts to contact him. I would love to speak to him about the car. Most people have told me that he will never, ever sell the car under any circumstance, a position I certainly cannot fault because I would be in a very similar boat if I ever figured out a way to own it. And so I don't think I'm all that much closer to owning it, but I have certainly ruled out that as a possibility, at least in the short term. And so I wanted to offer that as an update. We're still not exactly sure how what appears to be chassis 39 is continually re-registered in the UK. Tim Burton Schmi is going to come here sometime over the next few weeks, hopefully, now that he's on his US tour, to tell us a little bit more about that. And he's got some interesting things related to it. But regardless, uh, I have so much enjoyed the chance to chase a car like this. I don't know if I'll ever get to the end of that tunnel, but in the meantime, I'm having a whole lot of fun. And fortunately, I didn't get scammed. As we've talked about, don't let yourself be scammed on a car like this. There's the car, there's the title, and the money. Nobody gets to have all three. If, they, if you're gonna pay for it, make sure you're getting one or the other. You gotta protect yourself. I run into a lot of scams and I try to protect myself and all of them, but most of the time you end up just being entertained by someone's attempt to do so. And so again, thank you so much for watching and thank you for all the information about my favorite car. And be sure to go to a place where you should not expect to be scammed to mod find. It's a great enthusiast marketplace to buy and sell our favorite things about the automotive hobby. Parts, new, used, OEM, aftermarket, to our favorite cars, tools, cars, all the things. And so be sure to check them out, download their app, and thank them for their continued support of MinWiki. Stains in the carpet and the dashboard that I later found out was blood. For those of you who hadn't seen the other story, I bought a 2006 Dodge Ram 3500 like I'd always wanted from a DEA auction. And it turned out to have a super hot rotted motor on it. It also had a lot of modifications that were done by the smugglers, which seemed cool at the time, but ended up causing a little bit of trouble. First modification I encountered was at the first fuel stop. So I buy the truck, I take it on a test drive. It's amazing. It's got crazy power, built diesel, had a great time with it. Coming back and it had a little bit of fuel in it. So I pull into a truck stop. I put my credit card in the pump, put the diesel thing into the fuel filler and proceed to walk around the truck and start sort of inspecting again my new prize. I was so excited about it when I bought it and discovered the motor it had. I hadn't really looked at the other details of the truck. There was some damage done to the inside from a struggle that had happened. There were some stains in the carpet and the dashboard that I later found out was blood, but at the time I just thought it was a soft drink. Uh, there were, you know, I had like three mufflers welded end to end on it. And then the headers kind of wrapped in these sort of blanket things, I guess, to kind of keep the heat signature down. It had some infrared lights mounted on the front of it, like you would find on a Humvee or a striker or something for driving around with the infrared goggles. A few other things done to it that were just done to keep it stealthy and all that. I like these things were cool. So as I'm crawling around looking, I keep, you know, the pump's still running. I'm just thinking like, you know, man, this pump is slow. So I'm looking underneath it and I look up again, it's still pumping. So I look at the lights on the front, uh, it's still pumping. I, I kind of look at some of the damage inside. The radio plate had been kicked in, the visor had been ripped off, the seat was broken. There'd been a struggle in the truck. And I'm thinking, man, this truck is slow. And I walk around the back of it, looking at some more of the exhaust system on it. Then I glance over at the fuel pump to see it rapidly passing $200. Of course, that's a bit of a surprise. And I come to find out that this truck had a 67 gallon Titan fuel tank on it, one of the big extended range tanks for pulling an RV across the country or going on epic road trips, or maybe just driving out to the Mexican border to bring back guns or 
drugs or whatever. So, I, you know, I was in it now, so I let it fill to see how far it's going to go. And it gets to about $250. Took about 65 gallons of diesel in it. So that was a big surprise, but at least I had enough fuel to get back to Georgia without having to stop. So I get back on the road again. And again, this truck ended up having a an engine with, you know, nearest makes a difference, 700 horsepower and 1,150-something foot-pounds of torque. It was a lot of fun. So I'm having a great time just getting on the interstate and passing people and just speeding up, slowing down just so I can speed up again. I'm having way too much fun on this truck. And it's already late in the day when I left, so it, it gets dark pretty quickly. And one of the things I discovered was that the dashboard lights did not work. They had cut the wires to every light on the truck. So I pull over and I brought my toolkit with me. So I pull over and discover that, you know, again, the headlights, everything else had been cut except for those infrared lights. So I took some wire, wired the headlights just straight to the battery. Just at least I got lights, at least I got tail lights. But the dashboard lights weren't working. I'm like, I don't need dashboard lights. So I'm driving through the dark and I'm in like South Alabama at this point. And the problem I'm encountering is that I have a very fast truck that wants to go fast that I want to go to fast in, but I can't really see how fast I'm going. This is making me nervous. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go pop a fuse in, get the dashboard lights back just to have something, to some gauge so I don't get a ticket. So I pull off at this little gas station out in the middle of nowhere, South Alabama. So I parked the truck at these gas pumps. I don't need fuel, of course. I got fuel for a month now, but I parked it at the pumps. I got some light, and I walk into the store. And these little country stores out in the middle of nowhere, they're not your usual convenience stores just with snacks and drinks and things. They have, they're like a little hardware store, a little general store. They got a little camping section. They got a little car repair section. They got a little hardware section. And this store is being run by two girls. Not to be mean towards South Alabama or any rural part of the country, but these were country girls. And they had about 12 teeth between the two of them. Now, the smaller one, who smiled at me, and I could tell she was hogging eight of those 12 teeth all to herself, seemed to be going through an entire roll of scratchy tickets, just one after the other, scratching through. The one behind the register, who was not smiling, looks up at me with these kind of hollow eyes. She looked like, you remember Large Marge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the trucker lady? Sturdy girl, big arms. Very big arms, actually. She was wearing a sweatshirt with the neck ripped out of the sweatshirt and the arms ripped out of the sweatshirt just to kind of contain her girth and her neck and these big arms. And despite the ripped up condition of this shirt, it had a very cute Winnie the Pooh on the front. And I said, uh, ma'am, you got some poo on your shirt. She looks down and she looks up at me with these kind of hollow eyes and then she just smiles with those four teeth and said, that's just my bare chest. And she laughed and I laughed and I proceeded to walk to the store and I got a big old sweet tea and a couple of bag of pork rinds, some good snacks for the road and I bought a little packet of fuses from the automotive section right there next to the camping gear. And I walked back outside and I set the drink on the truck and I proceeded to get to the fuse box and find the fuse for the dash lights and I popped that fuse in. Turned the switch on the truck and immediately smoke starts pouring out from under the dashboard. Like, I can't stop it. So I'm turning the switch off, but smoke is beginning to grow. Now my day is just, my evening has just gone completely wrong. Now my brand new prize truck, I'm so excited about smoke's coming out of the dashboard. It's coming out of the vents, it's coming out of the hood. I'm running around. I, I go to the, you know, try to, it's an electrical fire. So I'm, I'm, the hood's already up. So I start tugging at the battery. And I can't get the batteries out. And I look and, you know, there's always the fire extinguisher there by the gas pumps. That fire extinguisher's gone. I look at the other pump. That fire extinguisher's gone. I go sprinting back into the store. Now, the two ladies who were obviously seeing this go down, as soon as I get in the door, the lady goes, there ain't no fire extinguishers and don't call no 911 because we ain't got none of that neither. So I dash back outside, I grab the hatchet off out of the camping side. I just grab the hatchet and run back outside. I just took the hatchet and just hacked the battery cable. Because I'm pulling at the batteries, they got the straps and the bolts. I just hacked the battery cables out of the truck, you know, trying to contain the fire. But now the plastic is on fire. So I got my big old sweet tea and I just goosh it right in the dashboard, put out the electrical fire. And now I'm just standing there with an empty sweet tea having just hacked up my brand new truck with just melted plastic and the reek of burnt plastic and rubber and the gauges are all, looks like Salvador Dali painted them. They're all molded. I, I was just, I was gutted to say the least. You know, fire's out. I go back inside and, you know, they kindly didn't charge me for the hatchet. They let me put it back on the shelf. I asked them, you know, 
if there was a repair shop or anything like that nearby and they talked between the two of them, they figured the best guess was that there was a guy up the road, but they were pretty sure he was in prison right now. So it would be a ways I'd have to get it towed to like Montgomery or Mobile or somewhere like that. So I had to be back at work the next day. This is not going to work. So, okay, let's figure this out. So I go outside and I, you know, start looking at the damage. The dashboard's toast, but you know, the switch still works in the key. Use my pocket knife and I, I stripped back the battery cables and just twisted them together. Got the battery cables back going again. Uh, the dashboard is toast. Obviously what had happened is at some point they had cut all the wires to all the interior lights and the headlights. They had cut all the wires, but then twisted them all back together for some reason. So when I put the fuse back in, it just completed the circuit and caught something on fire and just melted the whole dash out of this thing. So I took some wire out of my tool kit. I, I just kind of, you know, wired the ignition, got a wire to the computer, just wired everything to the battery basically, bypassed all the melty bits. And this is one of the things I love to come as diesel because it they're simple, they're easy, you can fix them with a rock. Sure enough, turned the switch on, came back to life, cranked the truck, proceeded to drive it from South Alabama nonstop all the way back to Georgia with no lights, windows down, plastic burning rubber fumes blowing past my nostrils. So get it back to Georgia, and I proceed to have to replace the entire dashboard of this truck, bunch of the weather stripping, a bunch of the climate control system, had to rewire the whole truck, and these are just some of the problems you encounter when you buy an ex-drug smuggler truck. Shopping for insurance can be an absolute nightmare, but it doesn't have to be thanks to Policy Genius. They're our sponsor for this month at Benwicki, and you can visit them at the link in the description below. You tell them a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your property, and they find the best deal by shopping amongst all the major carriers at the same time. In fact, you can bundle things like homeowner's insurance and auto insurance, and the average user that bundles both of those things saves about $1,100 a year. So be sure to check them out and thank them for their support of VinWiki. Unfortunately for him, Scooby-Doo style, some meddling kids were making a video from another lane of traffic of the car driving along. And you clearly see the car without really turning just go straight into the bay. And conspicuous in its absence was a pelican. About two years ago, I made a video about one of those cars that's really gotten away that I really kicked myself for not finding a way to make the opposite decision. It was a 2006 Bugatti Veyron that at the time and still to this day was the cheapest one to ever sell. Now, I've been very clear that the Veyron is really the only car above my LP640 in terms of value other than a McLaren F1 that I honestly do dream about owning. And the fantasy of ever stumbling across the world's cheapest version of it is obviously something that dominates my psyche. But at the same time, this car just couldn't be made to make sense at the time. And I shared the whole story of it, but the car's backstory was just about as insane as you could ever imagine. It really got interesting around 2009 when a man named Andy House drove it into the Galveston Bay. Now, obviously I like flood cars. I do prefer a freshwater flood, but what happened was he decided to just drive it into the bay. And he claimed to his insurance company that he did so avoiding a pelican. Unfortunately for him, Scooby-Doo style, some meddling kids were making a video from another lane of traffic of the car driving along. And you clearly see the car without really turning just go straight into the bay. And conspicuous in its absence was a pelican. And so they obviously decided this was insurance fraud. They did not pay out the claim. They charged him with insurance fraud. And he went to prison for about 10 months. I think he had a longer sentence, but he got out early. And during that time and throughout the insurance investigation, the car had been kind of put in the custody of a Houston-based exotic car mechanic who at some point might have been interested in rebuilding this car. And so he had provided estimates and disassembled the car and kind of spread it out amongst about a third 
3,500 square foot warehouse where it set for a very, very long time. But once Mr. House got out, he still had clear title to this car. And so he tried to sell it and did so to an exotic car dealer. Now, of course, since the insurance company did not pay out a claim, the title did not have a brand. It didn't have a salvage title or a flood title or any of the other things that would render the car unacceptable to most lending institutions to finance. And so this exotic car dealer, or I suppose its owner, got a $980,000 loan for the car. Now a clean title, 06 Bugatti, could somehow justify that kind of loan. And most exotic car banks do not require an in-person inspection or any proof that the car is actually functional. So even though he had paid obviously a lot less than $980,000, he then had the budget to start the rebuild. Unfortunately, his dealership went out of business, he declared bankruptcy, and he stopped making the payment. Now, during that time, the car never moved. It stayed with the same mechanic in the same shop, and actually, he started to paint the car white. But unfortunately, this exotic car dealer's business went under, he declared bankruptcy personally, and so the car was repossessed by the bank, which they obviously discovered was not fully functional. Now, of course, all of the repair bills and the parts and the painting and everything that had been done to the car using that budget between the $980,000 and whatever he had actually paid to buy the car were now with this mechanic. And he starts threatening the lien holder that he's going to mechanics lien the car if they don't pay him. Of course, they decide not to, and they actually end up just giving him title to the car because his bills at that point would have been several hundred thousand dollars. They would have had no real way to liquidate or even value what this carcass of a Bugatti might have been worth. So it goes into the ownership and continued possession of this mechanic, and he sells it again to a local Houston-based physician who has delusions of grandeur that he is somehow going to orchestrate the rebuilding of this car, and he doesn't. And so he asks the same guy to sell the car again for him, who then enlists Andy House, the guy who originally drove it into the Galveston Bay, to broker the car. So I start to see these Facebook posts, everybody starts sharing it, and the car is for sale in 2019 for $300,000. Now at the time, and still today, give or take a million dollars is the market value for an 06 or an 08 Veyron with some miles on it. And this is a nicely specced car, but obviously it needs a considerable amount of rebuilding. And so I begin the process of trying to decide, am I gonna try to buy this car? Of course, I didn't have $300,000. We had just started to get some traction on YouTube and I was having a lot of fun. The app was growing. Everything was going really well in life, but I was still in no position to buy the car, much less finance the inevitable repairs. And it was really, really hard to estimate the repairs. And so I called Freddie Tavarish, a good friend then, certainly a better friend now. And this was just at the end of his Gallardo rebuild, right around the time that he was starting the Murcielago project. So anytime a car is saltwater flooded, you're gonna get a tremendous amount of corrosion. And that was certainly present around the axles and the brakes and the wheels and everything along the bottom of the car, the turbochargers included. And we knew that the wiring was gonna be a problem. And since he had done a lot of rewiring on his Gallardo, it being a Volkswagen Group product, he had a lot of confidence that he was somehow going to be able to remake the wiring harness since Bugatti had been very clear that they were not going to sell any parts for this car. Now. We assumed that we'd be able to talk them into it, but that was certainly not a given. So I started talking to the guys from Premier Financial Services about what they would realistically loan on the car. And of course, I was very honest about its condition. I wasn't trying to get 900,000 bucks. I was just like, look, they want me to pay 300. I'm obviously gonna try to shrewdly negotiate this a little bit, but I'm gonna end up deep into the car and I'm gonna have to spend a lot more money on it. What can we do? We started talking about what the real liquidation value would be of the car as parts, as decoration, as furniture, and things like that. And eventually it just became clear that like financially, I didn't have a great roadmap as to how I was going to put this amount of money together. Beyond that, when you think about a 30 or 40% value reduction for a rebuilt car, even without a title brand, you know, you're looking at a car that was probably gonna be worth six to maybe $700,000 when it was done. Now today, values are probably a little bit higher, maybe it's a little bit more, but regardless, we didn't have a huge margin and it wasn't gonna be a profit-seeking flip. I didn't wanna sell the car once it was finished. I wanted to daily drive the thing. But I knew that if things went real pear-shaped, we didn't have a great ripcord to have a huge cushion to know that we could just buy more parts or do whatever it took to make the car right again. And so I didn't buy it, it went away, we made some videos about it. And I know for Freddie, even more than me, it was really the car that got away because again, both of our channels at the time were kind of at this point where we were starting to get consistent viewership. 
His would peak higher than mine. Mine would stay more consistent over time. But regardless, we weren't at a point where we could count on YouTube revenue to make a car that didn't make financial sense make financial sense. We were at the kind of point where if I got a ticket, the AdSense might pay for it. Or if he needed an extra part, it might pay for it. Those aren't Veyron numbers, unfortunately. And since we couldn't be super duper confident on exactly when we could have the car finished, it was a really hard thing to pitch to sponsors. Of course, sponsors aren't gonna buy you a Bugatti, but they might offer some financial cushion to help make a bad day less of a bad day. But that wasn't really available at the time, and it wasn't something that we could do. And so we both had to kind of let it go. But I know he spent a lot of time on the woulda, coulda, shoulda, wished he'd been able to figure out a way to do it. Now fast forward about a year, last summer, we were shooting our second Car Trek series. The first one being, who could buy the coolest exotic car for the price of a Camry? The second one was, who could find the most appreciated supercar? And we'd driven a really long route around Florida and up to Amelia Island for the first one, so we decided for the second series, we would do a fixed spot. So we wanted to find a place where we would have a mechanic, a track, a shop, all the different things that we could need to kind of build the storyline of a Car Trek series in one place and we decided to go to Las Vegas. We rented Spring Mountain Racetrack out in Pahrump. We went driving up in the mountains. It was just a fantastic trip in my Vanquish, Freddy's Maserati, and Tyler's CL65. And since we needed to be able to ship cars out there and we needed a shop for the wizard to do his inspections of our cars, we called Houston Crosta of Royalty Exotic Cars, an exotic car rental company in Las Vegas. Now, when Freddie told his story of kind of his thoughts on this project back two years ago, one thing he had mentioned is that there are actually a good number of used parts on the market, usually on eBay, for Bugattis. And the seller of most of those happens to be Houston. Now, he's owned several of the cars personally. He has a red one now. He had a Mansori modified one that he did a lot of videos with Daily Driven Exotics. And so he had rear wheel drive converted that. He had done a lot of service himself, both in fixing it after he broke it and in doing some of the routine stuff. Because the other monster in the closet, anytime you got a Bugatti that's been sitting, regardless of why it was sitting, is that the servicing is insane. Uh, the tires are $22,000 a set. The annual service, they say, is $21,000, and sometimes you can get a $10,000 service the second year, but then you gotta do another $20,000 plus thousand dollar one the next year. Anything that breaks is catastrophically expensive, and so it's just one of those things that actually keeping one of these cars on the road is more of a private jet proposition financially than it is owning a Lamborghini or something that we've become a little bit more accustomed to. And so he had talked to Houston at the time about some of the parts and things like that. And back in 2019, Houston had also considered buying the car. But we knew that the car had sold elsewhere. I had heard that it went to Dubai. I heard some other rumors, regardless, whatever. But we knew that the car was no longer available because down the road, we had actually gone back and tried to buy it again. And so we show up at Houston's shop and he had kind of told us he had something he wanted to show us. Now, of course, there's new and interesting exotic cars in and out of his shop and his office every single day, so that was not wildly surprising. But when we go into the shop that he told us we could use to film, up on the lift is a black Bugatti Veyron. And it's got a lot of corrosion on the underside. And we're like, you bought it. He said, yep, I bought it. Now this had just happened. So the car had been somewhere else for the better part of a year. And we were just now learning about this and he was still pretty cagey about the details, but obviously it was his intent and he was already well into disassembly to put this car back together in a functional way. He had an exhaust, he had an aftermarket set of wheels, he had all the fluids, a service kit ready right behind it. And so, I mean, Freddie and I are just going nuts because this dream that we had is now gonna be on another YouTube channel and it's gonna be in another person's garage. And it was just a little bit heartbreaking while we're in the middle of trying to put on a show and avoid the heat for car trek. And so we look around the car a lot more than he wanted us to. I took a lot of pictures that he wasn't that excited about. But since then, he's explained a lot more to me about how he came about owning the car. And he told me that he didn't mind if I shared a lot of that with you. And he's gonna come by at some point in the next few months to tell more of the story because he's almost done now, over a year later, with putting the thing back together. And so what he said happened is that at the time that the car sold, he had a full interior, he had a bunch of body panels, he had some axles and other things listed on eBay for a Veyron for sale. And the guy that bought the car for 300 grand contacted him interested in some of the parts. And Houston was obviously willing to sell him. I think he worked out a deal at one point to sell him most of the stuff for about 150 grand, something like that, which is a really good deal relative to what you'd have to pay. But who else was gonna buy the thing? And I think it kind of crept into this guy's mind that he was the market for used Bugatti parts and he felt like he was being taken advantage of. Now that also could have had something to do with the fact that he told Houston that he had already spent $100,000 on the car. 
Now, Houston asked him, he's like, what did you spend the money on? Because the car had never left the same mechanic that had had it since 2009. He said, well, I paid him to paint the car black and he did some more disassembly and he did some more diagnosis and whatever. And so I'm another hundred grand in with that guy, 400 total. And eventually he just says, Houston, will you just buy this car from me? And Houston says, well, of course I will, but I'm not going to pay more than 300 because it being black doesn't add any value to me. I can't see any work that he's done. And no one's been able to show anyone evidence that the car will actually turn over. He's like, I want to see a video of the pistons moving because we don't know how seized the motor is at that point. Nothing happens. He doesn't hear anything for a few months. And then he said one day in his email box, he gets a video and it is of the car turning over. So at that point, he agrees. He says that was the boogeyman of the whole equation was whether or not I was going to have to replace the motor. So sure, I'll pay you 400 grand. And he proceeds to start arranging shipping, at which point I think the windshield flew out of the car during open transport and shattered all over the highway. But regardless, he was still missing a bunch of parts, but it was now in Vegas, and that's the point in which we saw the car. Now, of course, Freddie and I were confused. It's like, who paints the car black before they do all the rebuilds? But this was now the second time that this mechanic had facilitated or done the repainting of the car, first to white, then now to black. And so regardless, it was a fascinating thing. So we're crawling all over it. Obviously, the interior is totally out of it. You can just see how rusted the turbos are and everything else. And I mean, the car is a basket case, but Houston's mechanic had probably done more independent Bugatti service than just about anybody else in the United States at that point. So if anybody was up for it, it was going to be him. And he was talking about some of the things he wanted to do. He actually took us in to show us his full interior for the car that was gorgeous, kind of a natural brown, like Ferrari Cuyo, something like that. And he was getting rid of most of the gray interior and stuff like that. And so, you know, he knew he was going to need a lot of parts. And he told me this week that he spent over $250,000 on parts with Bugatti. So fortunately, obviously he spent a lot with Bugatti servicing his other cars and stuff like that. They did sell him a lot, including a wiring harness, which was the biggest issue. And so he is still waiting on a few over a year later. And so he's hopeful that he'll have most of the rest of the parts soon to be able to get the car to run. Now, again, that doesn't include getting the car serviced. It doesn't include making the car drive. He said the Burmeister sound system is totally corroded and that's over $100,000 to replace with new parts. He's not sure how he's gonna deal with that. It's a full fiber optic system. So it's not without more hurdles, but we did find the car and I can't explain how shocked Freddie and I were. And I know that we both kicked ourselves because today, kind of like Freddie described in the economic video about his 675 LT, he's spent what he could have just bought a good car for when he started the project. But at the same time, he's created amazing content. He's gotten good sponsorships. He's made some AdSense revenue. And so it's not a wildly profitable endeavor, but it makes it make sense. And if we were approaching the project today, we could make it make sense. In fact, Houston has bought Alex Rebuild's channel. It's now Royalty Rebuilds, and he's gonna use that as a way to release a series of what he's doing with this car, including he's repainted it again. It is now purple. And a uh, nice shade of purple, I suppose. Wouldn't have been what I would have done with it. And he's obviously making the car a heavily modified example. He's probably going to keep it rear-wheel drive. He's going to keep aftermarket wheels on it, aftermarket exhaust, maybe even an aftermarket ECU tune and stuff like that. And that wouldn't have been the way that I necessarily wanted to own it. I love the way they built the car in the first place. I loved how it was set up to go 250 miles an hour. And so taking it away from that would have diminished the experience for me. And so... I'm glad it's him doing it that way rather than me trying to do it mine because I know I would have ended up a million dollars into the thing, which I still don't have. And so that would have been heartbreaking just to watch the car sit, collect more dust and wait for me to be able to figure out a way to do it. But regardless, it was awesome to be reconnected with the car and I cannot wait to see what Houston does with it in the future. We'd like to thank Patrick Adair Designs for their support of the VinWiki channel this month. Patrick and his team make some of the most amazing rings you've ever seen, including this one made out of carbon and the aluminum from one of the wheels of my LP640. They've just released a new automotive themed ring with carbon fiber and anodized titanium. It's a super cool looking thing, and whether you're looking for a wedding band or just a fashion ring or whatever you want a ring for, he has some amazing options. You can use the code VinWiki for a discount, so check them out now at the link in the description below and thank them for their support of VinWiki. You mess up once, you end up in the desert. I think everybody's watched the movie Casino.
I own a detail company in Vegas uh, since 1994. Uh, that's quite a long time. And of course, as you know, uh, Vegas is driven by what? Gaming and entertainment. And the casinos happen to be um, my clients. Uh, that being said, I have a lot of stories of different executives and people and management and dealers and pit bosses. One day a guy comes into my shop in Vegas. He's driving a brand new Ferrari. It was a 360 Stradale. He said, hey, I heard about you're the best guy on black cars, yada, yada, yada. And I said, can I ask what you're, who, who are you? And he says, oh, you don't know who I am? And I said, no, I, I really don't. He says, I'm Mark Shore. And I said, great, nice to meet you, Mark Shore. He said, you still don't know who I am. And I said, really, I, I really don't. And, and I don't mean that with disrespect, Mr. Shore. And he said, well, I am Steve Wynn's brother-in-law. Uh, and I am an avid Ferrari guy. In fact, I'm going to bring Ferrari into Las Vegas. Uh, we're gonna buy a franchise, we're gonna team up with Penske, and we're gonna put it in a new hotel called The Wynn. But that being said, I need the best of the best work on my car. She went to a body shop at the time who I was servicing. It's called Exotic Car Paintworks in Vegas. He's the go-to authorized Ferrari, Rolls, Bentley. And so Mark says, well, I want you to work on this car. I says, great. And he says, so after a couple months of working on his cars, he was a great client. He was coming to me often. Um, he says, I, I really would like to introduce you to, to my you know, brother-in-law. And I said, okay, great. Can you come down to the Mirage? And I said, yeah, sure. So I get down the Mirage and I walk in this crazy James Bond looking offices. And there's a secretary and I feel like Miss Penny's sitting there at the desk. And she says, would you like some coffee, cappuccino, some champagne? And I'm thinking like, I'm just a detail guy. What am I doing here? And uh, I walk in and there's Mr. Wynn, Mr. Steve Wynn. And she shakes my hand and says, you know, I've got a bunch of different cars. Uh, Mark speaks very highly of you. My wife is very particular, Elaine at the time. And uh, we want you to start working not just on our personal cars, but we want you to work on all the cars. In fact, I'm gonna give you keys to my cars and you're gonna be in charge of my personal fleet. I have a property um, out in the middle of the desert called Shadow Creek. I don't know if you've ever heard of Shadow Creek. It's a very uh, famous resort, which he basically built this oasis out in the middle with pine trees and forests in the middle of the desert. It's like 300 acres. And I used to go out there and pick up the cars and I would go to the gate and there would be guys standing there with AR-15s. They all knew me. And I would pull up and it was the most surreal experience pulling into this resort where you felt like you were not in Vegas. You felt like you were, I don't know where, somewhere else where in the world. But when I pulled in, I had the clickers to the garage doors. I had the keys to the cars. I mean, I'm like 20 some years old and I had all this trust. But I also at the same time, I worried because you don't mess with these guys, right? You mess up once, you end up in the desert. I think everybody's watched the movie Casino. The point is, is that the relationship, the, the Vegas was a small town, it was a good old boy town. And what I started to learn was build relationships with the people who made this town and it'll make your business. And I did it really quickly. You know, I built trust with these guys and I was operating out of a little shopping center that I got a special use permit to put a wash rack or canopy in, if you watch my YouTube video. Elaine, his wife, was into Bentleys. They had a black flying spur. In fact, I can, if I can try to dig up the pictures, I think I have the pictures with, she had a vanity plate and it was the same letters and everybody knew that was Elaine's car. Steve was not into cars, he wasn't passionate. I would say Elaine was more passionate about cars. So she had uh, two uh, black flying spurs for a couple of years when we were working with the cars and then you know, their house was next door to Mark's house and then their garage sometimes would have Steve's cars or vice versa. But they probably between the two garages had between eight and 10 cars parked there, you know, and then they had some cars on the casino properties because they would sometimes stay in the casino properties, uh, then come home, you know. There were some very peculiar things I found in the cars uh, and I, you know, obviously due to privacy, I can't share that. But uh, let's just say the mafia stories are real, you know, as far as like uh, things that you see that you're not supposed to talk about. But I always respected their cars. Mark was the one that talked Steve into getting the Ferraris. He always told me, he's like, I think cars are cool, uh, but it's not my passion. Uh, real estate's my passion. Building business is my passion. And I mean, I have very, very brief conversations with him. It wasn't like we sat there and talked for a long time. But the thing about Mr. Wynn, there's a couple stories. One is, I remember, is in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, I don't know exactly when, I got called down to his office and he pulls me in and says, uh, you're doing a great job. 
I'm really impressed. In fact, I have an opportunity for you. And I said, great. And he said, you're going to come work for me. And I said, work for you. I don't want to work for anybody. He said, I'll give you a stock. You'll be set for life. You're going to run my transportation. I said, Mr. Wynn, I really respect this opportunity, but I got to tell you, I can't do it. I'm, I, I think you understand. You've been your own boss. You, you know, I, I know your story. And he said, I, I support that, but you're never touching one of my cars again. And he said, have a good day, Mr. Light. And I walked out and I said, wow, that was a great time to serve somebody of that level of business. I respected him. And I was a little sad walking out because I was like, well, am I going to lose Mark? Sure, as a client. And fortunately, I didn't lose Mark as a client. Um, and when the Ferrari dealership did open, they did create their own detail department. But when they had very particular customers, they would call me on the phone and say, hey, we need your help. Um, at that time, it was Rich Kansky, who was service manager, who was service manager at the Porsche dealership, who I knew when I started the business. And now he's the service manager for Tobin Ferrari. But, you know, there's a lot of stories in Vegas. That was one. If anybody's ever heard the story about the win in the Ferrari franchise, I can't say firsthand I was there or saw it, but I had very close friends and inside people that could tell me the facts of what really happened. Apparently, Mr. Wynn had bought a La Ferrari. And if anybody knows about the when you buy a La Ferrari and brand new, you, you have an agreement with Ferrari that you will not resell the car. I think it's for two years. And Mr. Wynn hated the car. And he wanted to get rid of it, and he found a buyer. And at that time, uh, Ferrari came in to the Wynn, where the franchise was within the hotel, and said, you know, we're going to have a marketing meeting. And then in the conversation came up, Mr. Wynn, what happened to your La Ferrari? And he said, I sold it. And they said, hey, you cannot do that. That's not what you do. You have an agreement with us, you are a franchise owner. And it got into an argument. And Mr. Wynn does not play. Uh, it's his rules or you hit the road. And he basically got into a quite heavy discussion and debate and, and turned into an argument where they said, we're pulling your franchise. And at this time, Mr. Wynn was on 100% ownership of the dealership. I mean, Penske and him are partners. Pesky calls him on the phone and says, you know, what, what's going on? And he said, they could take this Ferrari and up there, and you can go from there. But, and so anyway, Steve said, I, I don't care. Uh, in fact, uh, I escorted him off the property with my security and told him don't ever come back on the property again. And this is true. He escorted him off. Ferrari management. I mean, Steve, like I said, is a very determined man when he wants something. It is what he says. It's non-negotiable. So they got escorted off the property and immediately the franchise was up for sale. And from what I understand, they contacted the Tobin family, um, who is the Bentley and Rolls in Austin Martin. And they said, 100%, we want it. And they took over the franchise. So that was kind of an interesting story. Um, I knew Mr. Wynn servicing him that he was great as long as it was on his terms. And if it wasn't something he didn't want, you weren't part of his life and business or personal, that's it, you're done. And uh, But you gotta respect a guy like that. I mean, he made what Vegas is today um, as a world destination, a visionary. And when somebody's like that and they have their focus, you gotta respect the fact that they get things done. Um, and I think the Italians understood that. I mean, everybody knows the Ferrari and the Ford GT story. And it kind of reminds me of that battle between two alphas. You know, we're the brand of the world, but we're the casino of the world. And then the two come together and what do you got? Premier Financial Services has been a sponsor of VinWiki for the last four years, and we can't thank them enough for their support, and we love them for that, but also because their simple lease truly is a tremendous product in the world of exotic car financing. They allow you to minimize your payment, minimize your down payment, take all the tax advantages that are available for a lease, while still giving you the ability to move in and out of cars and accumulate equity. So they structure it in a very unique way that's hugely advantageous, gives you a lot more buying power, and their customer service is absolutely incredible. So we love Mitch and their team for their continued support of the channel. We thank them for that. But please visit them at the link in the description below and find out how easy it is to buy your dream car through Premier Financial Services. And somebody goes, what's that going to cost? They go, a billion dollars with a B in 1965.
there was a time, believe it or not, where Chrysler made huge advances in actually trying to build a turbine car for the public, a turbine powered car. Now, some people have heard of this, but most people don't know the extent that Chrysler went in this project. And that's the startling thing, because back in the 1950s, a guy came to Chrysler, an engineer, who said, you know something, they're making great strides in turbine technology. And, and there were turbine aircraft, there were fighter craft powered by turbines during World War II on all sides. Germans had them, the, Eng the British had them, and Americans were building them shortly thereafter. So turbine-powered aircraft were becoming very well known. And somebody said, why don't we put one in a car? And so Chrysler said, you know something, we've always experimented with different things. Sure, knock yourself out. So they set up a little turbine division in Highland Park. Consider putting a turbine engine in a car. So they got to work and they actually built a turbine engine that was fairly small compared to what you'd see in like say an airplane. And it was an automotive turbine, so it had to have some different things done. It had to be a better casing, for instance, in case one of the blades separated, as they say, at high speed. And so they actually built a turbine engine that they could connect up with a transmission and power a car with, and they dropped it into a car in 1953. Most people know that Chrysler was building turbine cars in the 60s, but they put one on the road in 1953. The guy in charge of the program was a guy named George Hubner. George Hubner was a, uh, an engineer, but a very, very flashy engineer. And I jokingly tell people that he was an extroverted engineer, which is something that doesn't exist very much in nature. And he loved publicity. So he would actually call up the press and go, hey guys, I got a jet powered car, you wanna see it? And a whole swarm of reporters would show up. He'd demonstrate the turbine powered car. So he realized people love this stuff because cars, after the war was over, you know, the, people were buying cars, but there hadn't been any major changes in automotive technology that were this kind of seismic changes. So the idea that there'd be a jet-powered, a turbine-powered car would really cause people to go, really? That's crazy. And the interesting thing about a, a, a turbine engine in a car is they sound like a turbine engine in an aircraft. George Hubner realized people love this idea. But the cool thing about turbine engines is they have fewer moving parts than a piston engine. They don't reciprocate, they spin. So they run smoother. Fewer moving parts, they run smoother. And oh, by the way, they'll run on anything that burns. So they would do demonstrations where they'd run it on alcohol, kerosene, home heating oil, VO5 hairspray, tequila, peanut oil, vegetable. They, they would do these demonstrations and show it's multi-fuel. The weird part is that in the 50s and 60s, nobody cared. Gasoline was cheap. It's like saying I have an alternative to water. You go, it comes out of the wall and I turn this faucet. I don't need an alternative to water. Gasoline is the same thing back then. So nobody really cared about the multi-fuel aspect of it right away. So Chrysler has the turbine car. George Hubner's promoting it. He's hoping that if he can get enough people in the public to want the car, he can convince Chrysler to start building the cars and selling the cars. There's a major problem though because turbine engines are very, very picky in their, you know, how they're made up. They need to have, you know, exotic metals, very, very precision parts. So there is something that they have to work out with this, with the technology, but it's doable. So they get the first car on the road. It seems to be running fine. They upgrade the engine. They eventually had a seventh generation engine. So seven generations as they improved, improved, improved along the way. So second or third one they build, George Hubner announces, just so you guys understand how serious we are at Chrysler about building turbine engines, we're gonna actually drive one cross country. So they brought a turbine powered car to New York City, had a thing on the side, cross country turbine trip. George Hubner's in the front seat, holds a press conference to everybody and they drive it cross country. Everywhere they go, they're doing interviews, TV, radio, newspapers show up. It's a huge publicity event that's unbelievable. People are clamoring for turbine-powered cars. The weird thing is that Chrysler's hinting they're gonna build them, but they've never talked about how expensive they're gonna be or anything like that. But it's something that George Hubner's convinced will happen if he gets enough ground support for this. So somewhere along the line, early 1960s, he gets permission to build a fleet of turbine-powered cars. They actually engage Ghia in Italy to build the cars. Uh, Elwood Engel, who recently come from Ford to Chrysler, designs the cars. And he designs a car that's specifically going to be nothing but a turbine car. Up until this point, they dropped the turbine engines in other cars they built. Now they've got a specific purpose-built car that's going to be a turbine-powered car. And they call it the turbine car. 
So they build 55 of these cars in Italy. They ship them over here. They bring them to a plant in Detroit where they tear them apart. They put the powertrains in them, reassemble them. And they announce that if you want to drive a turbine car for two months, contact Chrysler and we're going to draw the names of various people at random. And you might get to drive a turbine car for a couple of months. That's just part of this huge project. They got so much attention, mountains of postcards being sent in. It got all this attention and they started doing this. They started delivering cars to people. So they'd call you up and say, hey, congratulations. You get a turbine car for two months. And they'd come to your house. And oh, by the way, we're going to call the press. They're going to be there too. Hold a press conference in your front yard of us handing the keys over, demonstration, maybe let the journalists take it for a drive. But for two months, you get to drive it. All you got to do is put fuel in it. If it breaks down, give us a call. But other than that, just drive it around. I interviewed people who got those cars. They said for two months, they were rock stars. Everywhere they went, people would look because it sounds, it, it sounds like a low-flying airplane. You look and the car is distinctive looking. 54 of the cars were painted turbine bronze. It's a really cool looking car, really cool sounding car. I spoke to people who said they would go to the store to buy like a loaf of bread and come out and be a crowd of people around the car. They have to show them the car, fire the car up, take people for drives, drive it around. I know people who said they got so sick of it, they hid the car. They come home from work, put it in the garage, close the door. A guy told me he forgot to close the garage door and he looked outside and there was a school bus stopped and all the kids were coming up to look at his car. So they got all this publicity for a couple of years. People were going insane. They wanted to buy these cars. Chrysler was getting people contacting me saying, I don't care what the price is. I want to buy one. Here's a check, sending them down payments. I want one of these cars. Well, here's the thing. They knew how much it cost to build the cars. They're built in Italy, but they could build cars in America much cheaper. So the car cost is not that bad. The car actually had a torque flight transmission in it, which is what Chrysler was using at the time. So they had off the shelf technology for that. What really mattered though was the cost of the engine and they had done a lot of work through the first four generations of the turbine engine this is the fourth generation turbine engine in the Ghia. they for instance inside a turbine have a bunch of fan discs which have fan blades on them and if you look in the front end of an airplane's jet engine you'll see the fan blades well the fan blades have to be really really perfectly balanced and so on to make sure the thing spins properly chrysler had actually developed a technology where they could cast those they could cast a disc as a single casting. So it was going to save them a ton of money. But they did not have any infrastructure in place to start manufacturing turbine engines. So somebody actually said, you know, you got to build a factory from the ground up just to build these engines. And somebody goes, what's that going to cost? They go, a billion dollars with a B in 1965. <laughs> and so they go, um, that's not going to work. So I interviewed the guy who made the call. They actually called up a guy who was a, a pricing guy in Chrysler. And they would often bring him in and say, hey, what would it cost us to, and they'd give him a hypothetical, you know, take that engine and put it in that car. What's it going to cost us if we wanted to make that car like a foot shorter, whatever, you know. And they, and they actually said, dude, it's your job. Find out what it's going to cost to mass produce turbine engines and stick them in cars. And he went and contacted all the various people. And the lowest estimate he got was $10,000 per engine. <laughs> so he went back and he said, okay, guys, here's the problem. 318, typical off the shelf V8, it's a couple hundred bucks. Turbine engine, 10 grand. There's no way that you can possibly sell these to the public and break even, let alone turn a profit. No one will buy them that expensive. So they kind of buried those numbers and those stories in the press and they just said, well, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. And the weird thing that happens though, right around this time, is that the federal government starts clamping down on tailpipe emissions. And the turbine engine, which will burn on anything, it'll burn anything, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, doesn't matter. The tailpipe emissions were something they never worried about. But they started clamping down on things like NOx emissions. And it turns out that that's one of the things that the turbine engine doesn't do real well with. And many companies, for instance, started going with catalytic converters to solve this problem. And there was almost no way for them to go back and re-engineer the turbine engine to be as good as it was, along with the tailpipe emissions that they never saw coming. Plus... Chrysler had its first financial troubles shortly thereafter, the first time they almost went bankrupt. So Chrysler downsized their turbine program. They called back in the 55 cars that they had out there. Many people saw those cars. For instance, they had the car at the World's Fair, uh, and they gave people rides in the World's Fair. The car was all over the news, Time Magazine, New York Times. Everybody had stories about the Chrysler, amazing Chrysler jet car, turbine car, whatever they called it. They continued building upgraded versions, fifth version, sixth version, and they actually built their last turbine car in 19. 83. And they had this turbine powered car that ran just fine. But the problem they had with it is they could never get the cost of the engine itself down to a point where it made sense. 
And so if you were thinking about buying a car and somebody said, okay, you can buy a piston engine to car over here or put a turbine engine, you know, for $10,000 upgrade, who's going to take that? And, and, and interestingly enough, it wasn't until the very end of the program where somebody said, oh, by the way, it's multi-fuel. What? You know, and, and, and so there's, there's photographs later where they actually show the car hooked up to a display that's got all these different fuels on it that, that it can burn, but nobody worried about that previously. So the program wound up getting mothballed. Uh, in all, Chrysler built 77 or 78 turbine cars total. The bronze car, the, the turbine, the, as she says, turbine on it, they built 55 of those. 54 of them were bronze. One of them was white. The cars were built in Italy. They're being imported into America. At that time, they had a choice to make when you import something from Italy. You had to either say, we're going to pay full import duties on it, or we're going to bond them and guarantee that we either ship them back out of the country or we destroy them. So Chrysler, when they brought over the 55 cars from Italy, had a choice to make. Are we going to want to keep all 55 of these? If so, we have to pay. So they actually only paid to keep about 10 of them. The other 46 were crushed and burned at a scrapyard in Romulus, Michigan. And I interviewed a guy who was there, and he said, you've never seen more grown men cry, literally crying, because they designed this car. It was hand-built in Italy by Ghia, and these things were works of art, and they had this space-age power plant. Now, they pulled the motors out of them because the motors weren't imported. So you can keep the turbines out, but they destroyed the cars. Of the nine cars that remained, they actually offered them to museums. Said, if you want one, you can have one. So, for instance, the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles has got one. The St. Louis Museum of Transportation has got one. The Smithsonian has got one. Two of them found their way into private hands. Jay Leno has got one. And there's a private collector in Indiana who's got one because one of the cars got sold to a museum. The museum sold it at an auction. Tom Monahan, the pizza guy, bought it. He sold it. And then later on, that guy got it. The sad part is that some of the cars that are out there don't run. So there's one at the Detroit Historical Museum that doesn't run. It was sent there with uh, just the casing for the engine, but the internals are missing. Jay Leno's runs. And in fact, I've had the opportunity to drive it, which is very nice of him to let, let me do that. And it's really, really cool. Went out to his place in California. Uh, we went for a drive. He drove first, and then we switched. <laughs> Want to drive my car? Sure. <laughs> Driving around. And the cool thing is I've owned a Chrysler product from that era. I owned a 69 Dodge Charger when I was in high school. I know how the steering felt. I know how the transmission felt. This car ran just like that. It felt just like that, but it sounded different. We're driving down the street in Burbank and people's heads are snapping around. It sounds like there's a low flying airplane coming in, a jet coming in, but it's not loud. It's not like it's so loud that it'll blow your mind, but it's, it's the, the, the whistling, whooshing sound. People, it sounds like a big vacuum cleaner, right? And so it's one of those things where it was so unusual, but so cool. Uh, the tachometer goes to 60,000 RPM. Red line is 60. The temperature gauge goes up into the thousands because it's not measuring coolant temperature. It's measuring the temperature at the ignition point in the combustion chamber. You know, that's what you measure on a jet, apparently. So there's so much cool technology that goes into this. But right now, Chrysler still has two of them. I've actually gotten to drive one of those as well. Uh, and the interesting thing is that all these bronze turbine cars, they're all identical, including the same key will start each and every one of them. And the reason I know that is that I interviewed the guy who delivered the cars to the v different people who used the cars. That program, by the way, where they lent the car out, 203 different families had the car. They put over a million miles cumulatively on those cars with almost no problems. It proved that the situ you know, they, they were viable. They're expensive, but they were viable. But Bill Carey, the guy I interviewed, uh, who's in the cover of my book, by the way, uh, Bill Carey told me, he goes, yeah, because one key would start the money, otherwise it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> Trying to remember which key was, goes what. Because ever have a fleet of cars? They all look alike. You can't say this one goes to the bronze turbine. They're all bronze, you know? So it was a fascinating concept. It was a fascinating project. And like I said, most people have heard maybe about the turbine car in the middle. But they started in 53 and ran through 83. And they built 77 turbine cars. But the primary one is the bronze one in the middle. They had that, you know, fleet of cars that they lent to the public. And... Chrysler didn't spend a penny, for the most part, on advertising those cars, and they got millions and millions of dollars of free publicity because the turbine car project in the middle was basically a gigantic publicity stunt. 
Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed our top 10 car stories from 2021. We can't wait to hear what stories come out of the woodwork in 2022, but now let's count down to midnight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year. Have a great 2022.